All right. Hello, 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 my friends. Jill Osborne from the Interstitial Cystitis Network. It is Sunday, October 22nd. Man, time is flying by so quickly. I can't believe it. I love, I love October. I love the fall. I love the call. It just, it's just so peaceful. You know, you get to rest and breathe and you're away from the heat and the oppression of the hot days of summer. Now we're in the cooling, rich days of harvest. Anyway, my name is Jill Osborne. I'm the president and founder of the Interstitial Cystitis Network. I'm here to do a live IC support group meeting. Um, uh, normally when I do these, I do a little 30 minute intro and then take your questions. I actually have a fairly big presentation to do today. Um, that said, we have a lot of movement happening in the IC world right now. We have a lot, hi Donna. We have um, a lot of new research happening. We've got some great conferences coming up. We've got, and of course, my job is to bring you all the best news from those conferences. That's what I really try to do. Um, 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 so the fall, uh, especially the International Pelvic Pain Society meeting, that is the big meeting of the year. So that said, how am I doing? You know, Donna, I'm doing okay. Um, I had a little few tears this morning. I did good for a week and then I cried a little bit. For those of you who don't know, I'm dealing with the loss of my parents. But I just keep saying to myself, they're in a better place and they're here and they love me. And I always know that. Um, my dad had a, had a favorite motto because my dad, my dad was born with this kind of funky heart thing that I've inherited from him where we get a lot of PVCs. We get, uh, so we have very, very strong heartbeats. And when he was young, he was in the hospital for a month as they were trying to figure it out. And it turned out it was from sunken chest syndrome that our chest cavity is, is about a half an inch shallower than a normal chest cavity. And so there isn't enough room for our heart to um, kind of beat normally. And so it's just very tweaky. Uh, it's not fatal in any way, shape or form. It's just something that we've learned to deal with. And if he lived till 100, I'm going to live till 100. Um, and so what he said is, Jill, whenever you're starting to feel funky, go push it. Go work out hard, which I did yesterday. I woke up yesterday wasn't feeling my best, just wasn't quite on point, feeling a little anxious. You know, those weird days when you wake up and you're just a little anxious and you don't really know why. That's how I was yesterday morning. It's like, that is so weird. Is that a really good week, really good Friday? And then all of a sudden yesterday, I wake up a little anxious. So got myself dressed, went to the farmer's market, came back, did a monster walk, double the normal walk. And by the end of the walk, I was good. And I think that that's kind of an important lesson is sometimes we got to get out of our head. We've got to get out of our stress and uh, find that normal and kind of get back high end, get back to finding some peace with our body because kind of, we feel like we're at war with our body, right? Doesn't it feel that way sometime? And um, I know for me that I feel the best when I'm moving and when I'm walking. I feel the worst when I'm laying down and sitting in the sense that I just, I don't feel productive and I don't feel healthy. Um, you know, they call sitting the new standing. The longer you sit, the weaker your muscles get. I was working with a patient last week who, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, this poor guy. And if you're watching, I'm really thinking about you, um, who, um, <clears throat> was over medicated with chemotherapy and it just really took the wind out of his sails and he was really having trouble moving and walking and finding that energy. And I encouraged him to just once an hour, get up and walk the hallway. The more we can walk, we just have to slowly but steadily build those steps towards fitness. Nobody expects you to go out and run a marathon. Nobody expects you to go run it, go out and walk a mile. Really, like literally, if you've been in bed, if you've been struggling, then walk five minutes. Walk up and down the street in front of your house. Walk up and down your hallway. Just the more you can move, the healthier your body will get ultimately. So 
Thank you, Donna, for asking. And how are you, hon? I hope that you're doing okay, too. I think we're on pretty similar journeys, but I think your journey is rougher than mine. And so sending you lots and lots and lots and lots of love. Okay. So you know what I haven't done in a while that I want to do? Because we always, it's always interesting the number of people who call me and they go, hey, we watch your show and hey, this and hey, that. And, um, um, and I realize now that a lot of people don't want to go read about stuff. They want to hear about it. So what, uh, and of course I'm here for your questions. If you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to ask. That's why I'm here. Thank you, Donna. I love you too. You're a sweetie. All right. So you know what I wanted to do because I'm finishing up our fall magazine right now. It'll be done in the next couple of days. And I um, was listening yet again to the class on IC that was taught at the American Urology Association meeting um, last spring, because again, that's my job. My job is to bring to you the most important information that we have. And uh, because we want you to find the most effective treatments, we want you to find the answer to your pelvic pain, et cetera, et cetera. And as I have been saying for the last five years, it's all about your phenotype. We know that if you give a patient a bladder med and you give them an antidepressant and you give them the diet and send them on their way and you won't see them for six months, that's not going to work for the great majority of patients. Why? Because many of us, if not most of us, really have something beyond the bladder that is also contributing to their pain. And that's why some patients who have their bladders removed are stunned to still have pain. Because pain can come from muscles, pain can come from nerves, pain can come from other structures. And so at the AUA meeting this year, they were very, uh, for the first time in the IC course, they were just saying, listen, treatment depends on phenotype. It's that easy. And their number one recommendation is when you have a patient coming in to get assessed for IC, you, you do a pelvic floor examination at that very first appointment. And if those pelvic floor muscles are abnormal and tight, they recommend an immediate recommendation or immediate referral to a pelvic floor physical therapist. Why? Because we have to understand the long-term toll of tight pelvic floor muscles. Uh, some of you have had muscles so tight that you haven't been able to empty your bladder normally. You're straining to go to the bathroom. You're struggling with constipation. Sex? Oh, hell no. Do not even, do not even approach me for sex at this point in time. Why? Because we have dysfunctional muscles that are driving everything. So I'm. I'm very, very happy now that what we have been saying, it's always very cool, you know, because we have to understand as patients, we have a lot of power. And, but we have to use that power uh, per, um, cautiously and, and with a tremendous amount of thought. And so um, when Chris Payne talked about phenotyping, you know, I'm the one that's been pushing that for years and years and years now. They are distinct groups. And it's very, very cool to see the language that we've used now at medical conferences. So good things are happening, my friends. Very, very good things are happening. Okay, so what I want to do is I'm going to actually very, very quickly go through the guideline statements for our IC treatment protocol, because we haven't done this in two years. And I want you to understand and see what doctors are supposed to be doing as they are working with you, okay? So the American Urology Association guidelines for IC were created um, in 2011, I think, revised in 2014, revised again last year. They were created by a a panel of IC experts and patient advocates to create consistency. Because before we had guidelines, man, it was crazy out there. Some doctors were treating IC with old treatments that we know don't work. Others were doing surgery. Others were doing Elmeron. Others were doing this. 
just completely random. And God forbid you be the patient and you go from Dr. A, B, C, D. It's very confusing because they all at that point in time had very different approaches to treating IC. Well, the purpose of our guidelines is to create a national standard. So every urologist working with IC should be following these guidelines. And you should know these guidelines because they will help you get the best care you can get. So let's go through them. So the way the guidelines are oriented is they have a series of statements and they have a total of 26 statements. And then each statement is supported by a lot of discussion and a lot of research. So let's just go through the statements. Now, the first four are on diagnosis. So the basic assessment, number one, the basic assessment should include a careful history, physical examination, um, and laboratory examination to document symptoms and signs that characterize IC, characterize IC and to exclude other disorders that could be causing their symptoms. So remember, this is a diagnosis of exclusion. So when you go into that appointment the first time, what are they going to do? They're going to do a proper UTI workup. Odds are they're going to check you for sexually transmitted diseases, even if you say you're not having sex. They're going to do that anyway. That's their job. It, they're going to look at your urine. Is there blood in your urine? If there's blood in their urine, they want to learn a little bit more about that. They're going to look at your body. They're going to uh, especially probe your history. You know, what do I always say? Is there an event that you associate with the onset of your symptoms? What do you think triggered your symptoms? Was it having a baby? I was working with patients this week. All of her symptoms began having a baby. And she had all the IC symptoms, but she also had tight pelvic floor muscles. She had a very, very difficult childbirth that involved a C-section. So that's an important trauma that her doctor needed to know. But then when you probe a little bit further, it's like, okay, tell me, were you an athlete when you were a kid? Were you a cheerleader? And she was like, mm, yeah. And I went, all right, flying splits? She goes, yeah. And I went, think about the trauma that a flying split does. You basically jump up in the air and you land on your, you know what, compression injuries. And, and the other thing that really confused her is she called me the same day she'd had a hydro distension with cystoscopy and her cystoscopy was completely normal and she was completely confused. And I turned that around in a very different way for her. I said, okay, that's fantastic. That's great. So we now know that you have a healthy bladder wall. They've looked at your bladder. There's nothing physically wrong with your bladder. And she's like, yeah, I don't get it. And I went, did they do a pelvic floor assessment? She said, yes. Are your muscles tight? She said, yes. Clue number one. Then you ask her that all important question. Is there an event that you associate with the onset of your symptoms? Yes. It began immediately having a child. Very, very difficult delivery with a C-section. That's a classic presentation that we see in this patient population that a pelvic trauma triggers a lot of these symptoms. And, and yet in her case, as I said to her, I think that her pelvic floor started getting tight when she, she was doing cheer because of the tremendous athletics and the many falls that she had. She had a lot of falls. Her muscles were probably starting to get tight and compromised when she was a teenager. But she didn't feel it. It wasn't that bad. But then she has a baby. And the childbirth is incredibly traumatic. That's our second and very, very severe pelvic trauma. And then eventually she starts getting bladder symptoms. And, and, and yet her bladder is normal. Okay. So diagnosis of exclusion. But your ability to contribute to that discussion and talk about your history is so incredibly important. And you have a lot of intuition. So really think about it. What do you think caused causes for you? Clinical guideline number two, baseline voiding symptoms and pain should be obtained in order to measure treatment response. What does that mean? 
it means you should do a voiding diary, like a three-day voiding diary, so we know where we're starting. Because if we know where we're starting, then we can measure treatment response. So if, for example, you're peeing 20 times a day and you're getting up three times at night and we've got a diary right here and then you start a treatment and you give it a month and you come back and do another voiding diary, gee, you know what? I'm actually urinating less. I'm urinating 15 times a day. Instead of getting up four times a night, I'm only getting up two times a night. That's a sign of progress. That's a very, very good sign of progress. In contrast, if a therapy is not working for you and you do your voiding diary again and you're actually getting worse, then we know that treatment is not working for you and it's time to abandon that treatment and look for something else. Okay. So that's guideline number two is, is give yourself something to measure your response with. Guideline number three, cystoscopy and or urodynamics should be considered when the diagnosis and is in doubt, but these tests are not necessary for making a diagnosis of uncomplicated IC. So back in the old days, oh, in fact, I even found the picture. So back in the old days, uh, we thought that this was IC. That when you looked in the bladder, if you saw these, what we call particular hemorrhages or glomerulations, we pretty much thought that was the classic case of interstitial cystitis. But this is all thrown out now. The finding of glomerulations or particular hemorrhages is a result of the test. That when you stretch the bladder, that's what happens. You're stretching tissue and blood vessels break. So for those of you old timers, if you were diagnosed 20 years ago on the basis of particular hemorrhages and glomerulations, that diagnosis is thrown out. That's what happens when you stretch the bladder. Um, and urodynamics, which is a test that really kind of helps them understand how your nerves are functioning. We've had a lot of research on it, pro and con. It's really not helpful in a diagnosis of bladder pain syndrome slash interstitial cystitis. Okay, guideline statement number four, and this is the last statement for diagnosis. Cystoscopy should be performed in patients where Hunter's lesions are suspected. Why? Because lesions need treatment. And the, 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 the most persistent cause of intense, severe chronic pain in IC patients is an untreated Hunter's lesion. A lesion is a wound in the bladder. It's only in five to 10% of IC patients. We now have a much better idea of what causes these lesions, that it is a viral infection in many of us. Um, but that said, for patients who are over the age of 50, who have more severe symptoms, or who have tried and failed multiple therapies, then they're probably gonna to wanna to look in your bladder. And there's nothing wrong with that. I don't like guessing, I like facts. And if I've been in pain for a period of time, especially intense pain, especially pain that's scaring me, I'm not interested in anybody guessing anymore. I want you to look at it and tell me what's going on. And there comes a point in time for those of you who have more symptoms, especially pain, especially pain on bladder fill, especially if you have extreme diet sensitivity, we want the doctor to look in there to get an idea of what's going on. And listen, it can be good news. If you find completely normal bladder, great. Celebrate for that for what it is. Now we're going to look for beyond the bladder. But some of you actually do have lesions and those lesions need treatment. All right, so that's a section on diagnosis. Hello, Jennifer from um, Wisconsin. I hope the fall season is treating you well. Hello, Florence. Florence says, what is a phenotype? A phenotype is, um, it represents different groups of IC patients. For some patients, they're driven by pelvic floor. For others, they're driven by Hunter's lesions. For others, by estrogen atrophy. And so today, when we try to diagnose IC patients, they're really looking 
beyond just a diagnosis of IC. They want to do something much more individualized. And we use phenotyping to do that. And over on the IC Network website, we have a, a couple of great articles on that. And I can go through that a little bit more too. icnetwork.org. Let me move my poster here so that it shows the URL. All right. All righty. So let's go to our next one. Our next guideline statement, management approach management approach. Now, this is also something that's very, very interesting because back in 2014, the American Urology Association had six steps of treatment and they were arranged with respect to the risk of adverse event that you start at step one, which is the easy treatment, and you slowly progress up until you find a treatment that works. Well, that is now abandoned because we're phenotyping. And so using a stepwise, a stepwise treatment algorithm doesn't make any sense. Your treatment is gonna depend upon your unique presentation. But here's something that's very different. They are really now focusing on the concept of shared decision-making. They want you to play a much bigger role in the, in the decision to try various treatments. But of course, the only way that you can play that role in an informed way is if your doctor shares the potential risks and the potential benefits as well as other treatment alternatives. So, so now treatment decisions are supposed to be very you know integrated so back and forth between you and your doctor well we can try this and then we can try this we can try this that's what i've been doing with my blood pressure med with my doctor and i'm driving her crazy <laughs> like i don't want to do that but i might be interested in doing this you know <laughs> but that's it's it's called informed decision making and it's called empowerment Okay, so treatment decisions should be made after decision-making with the patient informed of the risks, benefits, and alternatives. Except for patients with Hunter's lesions, initial treatment should be non-surgical. So they are admitting and acknowledging surgery is the last case scenario. We want to start, we still want to start with the less risky things first. Okay, concept number six, the efficacy of treatment should be periodically reassessed and ineffective treatment should be stopped. So I can still remember the sweet little old lady years and years ago who called me and she'd run out of money for her Elmeron and she'd put her entire life saving, every penny into buying Elmeron which is the only oral FDA approved med for IC. And I asked her, I said, well, did it help you? And she said, no. And I said, then why are you doing it? Why did you keep doing it? And she said, because there wasn't anything else. That was the only thing that they could give her. So AUA now is taking a very serious step back from that and saying, listen, if the patient is not getting better, stop the treatment. Let's not waste anybody's money and time. Um, somebody here on YouTube, Emma says, I just had a hydrodistension two days ago. I'm having so much pain at the moment. Emma, you are, I'm, uh, number one, it's over. Praise God, it's over. They have now looked in your bladder. We've got good information from, them, from that. Uh, do you know what they found when they looked in your bladder? And now you're dealing with that very normal post-op recovery from a hydrodistension. Hopefully you've got some pain medication for the first couple of days. The pain should be much better within a week. Um, if you notice that the pain is getting worse and or you have fever, it's very, very important that you call your doctor and you let them know because you might have picked up an infection during the procedure. Um, but what did they find when they looked in your bladder? Did they tell you or did they tell a family member? We'd love to hear that. Okay, let's go back to this. Now, here is something that surprises a lot of, a lot of patients. Uh, uh, guideline number seven from the AUA on IC. They're very compassionate and assertive about pain care. Multimodal pain management approaches, that includes medications, stress management, manual physical therapy should be initiated. Pain 
Management should be continually assessed for effectiveness because of its importance to that patient's quality of life. And if pain management is inadequate, then consideration should be given to a multidisciplinary approach and perhaps referring that patient to a pain center. Now, you'll notice the first thing they said is medications. AUA um, is receptive and supportive of the use of opiate medications if necessary. And that's very, very important because as Emma is going through right now, listen, one of the single most important, one of the single most painful things you can do is stretch your bladder. So, uh, so Emma, do you have some pain medication? Did they give you anything to get through this? Um, and last but not least, in the management approach, number eight, the IC diagnosis should be reconsider reconsidered if no improvement occurs after multiple treatment approaches. So you've done oral medications, you've done Elmeron, you've done bladder installations, et cetera, et cetera, and you're just not getting better. What does that mean? It means that it's probably not your bladder. It means that there's something else going on in your pelvis, which is triggering your bladder. That's very, very important. All right. So some of you have been on treatments for a decade. And if you're still flaring, you have to ask yourself, why? Why am I still flaring? Maybe this treatment is not the right treatment for me. Maybe we've missed something. Here, hold on a sec. Florence says, just so told my bladder was normal. Now my urologist wants to do bladder installations. Well, so Florence, uh, what about your pelvic floor? Did they do a pelvic floor assessment? Cheryl says, I've had several E. coli UTIs this year, and the doctor is suspecting that the cause is due to a weak sphincter. Are there exercises for a weak sphincter? I don't think so, Cheryl. Um, recurring UTIs is usually being driven by, by um, estrogen atrophy. Um, and so the reason why there's a group of women who get infection over and over and over again is because they don't have enough estrogen to produce that nice thick coating of mucus. Your bladder is like your mouth. It's a hollow organ that's wet on the inside. It's meant to be wet. There's a very thick mucosal layer called the glycosamino, uh, glycan layer, the gag layer that acts as a barrier. It's thick. And when you have a lot of gag, it's very hard for bacteria to chew through the gag and get to the cells to infect, uh, infect the cells. Unfortunately, that gag layer is estrogen dependent. So when you're young and have lots and lots of estrogen, that means you probably have lots and lots of gag. But if you're on strong birth control, if you're on Lupron, if you've had a total hysterectomy, or you're just getting older, you don't have the estrogen. And when you don't have the estrogen, it means you don't your body doesn't have enough estrogen to produce that nice thick coating. So your bladder's ability to defend itself from bacteria is now compromised. And that's not a disease, that's just aging. And so what the research shows is that for many women struggling with recurring UTI, the bacteria is actually first living in the vagina quite happily. So 24 hours before it arrives in the bladder, they find it in the vagina. And that researchers then ask themselves, well, what's happened to the vaginal defenses? Why has the vagina become a safe haven? <clears throat> and the answer goes right back to estrogen atrophy. So normally for patients with a recurring UTI, if you've got two in six months, three in a year, you meet the recurring UTI standard. <clears throat> in addition to giving you antibiotics, they should give you estrogen. Hold on a sec. Mm. <coughs> Emma says here, the doctor took two biopsies during the procedure and said my bladder is very, very inflamed. Okay, good information. Um, and that, yes, you're taking pain kids, but you're wearing nappies as your urine. It's in very small amount and it's a constant. Is that normal? Well, one of the things that happens when you're in pain is your muscles get tight. And as your muscles get tight, what happens is they start to uh, make it more difficult to urinate. And so if I were to guess, 
I would think that we're just dealing with a pelvic floor spasm right now that's making it more difficult for you to urinate. That would be completely normal given the procedure that you just had, plus you had two biopsies. Now we have to figure out why you're so inflamed, hon. That's a critical point, is where is that inflammation coming from? Uh, did they see Hunter's lesions, just out of curiosity? Mary said, oh, let's see, Kathleen said, well, bladder builder help, help develop a healthy bladder mucosal lining, help decrease the pain. Uh, bladder builder gives the bladder wall chondroitin, which it needs. Um, chondroitin is a building block of the bladder wall. And so chondroitin has a bit of a coating effect. And I, we don't have the proof that the bladder can introduce and pull that chondroitin out and put it into the bladder wall. Nobody's been able to do that research, but I will say that chondroitin bladder installations have been used uh, very successfully for decades in Europe or a combination of chondroitin and hyaluronate. It's called Uracyst. Um, Mary says medical marijuana is very helpful. Yeah, it is. Florence says, no, my urologist didn't even ask my history. I was in there less than 10 minutes. He put me on Uraspaz and only checked my bladder last week, even though I've had this problem since early September. Typical. Okay, but the good news here, hon, still is that your bladder's normal. So we have to look beyond the bladder. Um, so they didn't check your pelvic floor at all. If they didn't, call your OBGYN and go to your OBGYN and see if they'll check your pelvic floor. Kathleen said, that's me, estrogen dependent. The vaginal cream really dri drips out, 73 years old, recurring UTIs. Wish I could wear patches for HRT. You know, Kathleen, I um, my estrogen cream has never dripped out. Um, uh, I usually do it uh, before I go to bed. And by the time I wake up in the morning, you know, there might be a little tiny bit the first time. Let's say I put it in at 11. I usually get up once at four hours after I go to bed. I might feel a little of it like on my toilet tissue, but it doesn't drip out. Some patients also do too much. They think they're supposed to fill up the whole tube when in fact you're only supposed to put like this much in. All right. <laughs> Florence says, I feel more listened uh, by you, listened to by you than three tips from my, ear. I know, honey, it's hard. In medical care, it's hard right now anyway. All right, let's go back to our AUA, our AUA things. All right, so we have now gone through the, the four fundamental principles of how to manage IC. Shared decision-making, treatment should be reassessed, if pain is present, multimodal treatment should be done, and the diagnosis should be reconsidered if no treatment occurs after multiple uh, medications. So let's now go on into our treatments. So the first uh, group of four is all about non-medication-based treatments. So number nine, patients should be educated about normal bladder function, what is known and not known about IC, the, the risk versus benefits of treatments, the fact that no single treatment has been found effective for the majority of patients. Of course, we know why, because of phenotyping, for God's sake. And the fact that acceptable symptom of control may require tri trials of multiple treatments before it is achieved. I mean, you can, you can see that that's an old, old statement, and they chose not to revise it. But nobody should expect a single treatment to work for all of us because we're very different. Absolutely, very, very driven. You know, remember, for some it begins in childhood. For the others, it begins after menopause. For some, it begins after having a baby. While for others, it begins after falling and breaking their tailbone. I had another patient call me on Friday who she finally she uh, when she went to physical therapy after one of the meetings that we did here. What they find? She had broken her tailbone and it was out of position. Number 10, self-care practices and behavioral modifications that it can improve symptoms should be discussed and implemented, like diet, like muscle relaxation, 
working on stress and anxiety because of course nobody's telling you that it's all in your head but we listen a lot of you all of us right now are under massive levels of stress stress is always going to make pain more intensive and so we all have to work collectively at working on our stress management skills i was doing a lot of deep breathing yesterday as i was driving around in the morning because i was just not quite a hundred percent um, and AUA also encourages the use of over-the-counter supplements. Absolutely. Why? Because they don't carry the same risk of side effects that traditional treatments do. And so, um, and the, you know, and of course, for so many patients who don't have access to medical care or worse, they can't afford medical care. Thank God we've got some supplements that have been tried and true that are helping thousands of patients right now. And so don't assume that supplements are ineffective. The American Urology Association wants you to try supplements because they're less risky than more aggressive treatments. Okay, number 10, uh, let's see, number 11, patients should be encouraged to implement stress management practices to improve coping techniques and manage stress-induced symptoms. Absolutely, there's no shame in that. We all have to understand that. And number 12, Appropriate manual physical therapy techniques, in other words, maneuvers that resolve abdominal, pelvic, abdominal, or hip muscle trigger points to lengthen muscle contractures and release painful scars and other connective tissue restrictions, uh, if appropriately trained clinicians are available, should be offered to patients who present with pelvic floor tension or tenderness. Pelvic floor strengthening exercises like kegels should be avoided. We don't want to do things that will tighten muscles because the problem is the muscles are already too tight. So anybody who tells you to do kegels is wrong. Now, there is a technique called a quick flick, which is like, you know, because for those of us who have tight pelvic floor muscles, a lot of our work is focused on trying to relax those muscles. So, for example, when they do a kegel, you tighten those muscles and hold for a couple of seconds and then release. Well, a quick flick is exactly the opposite. You tighten a muscle very quickly, but then you focus entirely on the contraction. You tighten for a second and then relax for five seconds. And I know for me, what's so interesting, if I do three or four kegels in a row, I can absolutely feel that my muscles struggle to relax after that. My muscles are being real weird right now, I just have to say. Okay, here, hold on a sec. Emma says they did not find Hunter's lesions. Yes, excellent. I was also told to wait a few weeks. I may be given insulation treatment where they when they rule out bladder cancer. Okay. So, so Emma, let, let's just ponder a very important question here. So they found severe inflammation in your bladder, Hunter's lesion negative. That's fantastic news. So now we have to figure out what on earth is irritating your bladder so badly. Now, again, it could be tight pelvic floor muscles restricting blood supply, causing your bladder wall to break down. But this is where, if you were working with me on the phone, we would do a very, very deep dive into your diet and any other chemical exposures. Because if you're drinking coffee every day, if you're drinking soda every day, using artificial sugar every day, that also, or green tea, God forbid, if you're doing any of those every day, those could easily account for why your bladder is so incredibly inflamed. I was working with a couple, an older couple on Friday, and um, uh, he was, he was, um, oh, this was a gentleman where they overdosed him with chemo and they badly, badly damaged his bladder. And he um, was still drinking coffee every day. And his pain level was off the charts. And it's like, dude, if you had a wound on your hand, wound on your hand, would you pour coffee on it every day? No. Then why are you doing it to a wound in your bladder? They've told you you have a severe chemical burn in your bladder. Your job is to create an environment to support healing. So for some uh, men and women out there, that chemical injury can be accidental. But for others, it can be just from a very, very, very bad diet. It's possible. All right, let's go into our oral medications. Number Guideline statement number 13. Clinicians may prescribe pharmacologic pain management agents, including urinary analgesics, acetaminophen, NSAIDs, opioid and non-opioid medications, 
after counseling patients on the risks and benefits. Pharmacological pain management principles for IC should be similar to those for the management of other chronic pain conditions. So let me tell you the story of another patient I worked with last week or maybe two weeks ago. Um, she had abandoned all bladder treatments and all she was doing was taking pain meds. That's all she was doing for 20 years. Oh, I just take pain meds. And it's like, okay, and if you stop the pain med, it hurts, right? Yeah, that's why I keep taking it. And I'm like, but don't you want to fix it so you're not in pain anyway? And she goes, well, yeah, okay. So let's do a phenotyping. Let's see if we can try to figure out the underlying cause for that pain. Because nobody wants you to suffer. We want to get to the root cause of that pain, fix that, so you don't need pain medication in the first place, right? And, and, and again, in her case, we're, we were looking at a very old uh, pelvic injury, extremely tight pelvic floor muscles. And, um, and she said, yeah, but physical therapy, it hurt. And I'm like, yeah, it hurt. Why? Because your muscles are jacked up. We got to fix that. And the thing is, is that muscles respond beautifully to therapy. So if they touch a muscle and it hurts, that's good news because they found it. So now you need to go back to physical therapy and we need to understand that injury a little bit more. Because you don't have a life right now. You're at home taking pain meds. We want you to have a life. We want you to enjoy your grandkids. We want you to be able to have sex with your husband. And our, and she was, you know, hopeless until we talked. And then she was like, oh, I never really looked at it that way. That's the way we're looking at it now. We want to get to the underlying cause. All right. Uh, number 14, oral medications. Amitriptyline, cimetidine, hydroxyzine, and pentosin polysulfate may be administered as oral medications. So amitriptyline, a low-dose antidepressant, acts by calming nerves down. So amitriptyline is really ideal for a pain patient, somebody struggling with pain, and specifically central sensitization, widespread pain. Cimetidine, which is not used very much, acts as an antihistamine. Um, is that right? It's, I, it so rarely comes up. Is it? Yeah. Well, here, hold on. Let me make sure I got that right. I think I got that right, but hold on. Chimetidine method of action. Yeah, I was right. Okay. Well, okay, it's an H2 receptor antagonist that competitively blocks histamine from stimulating H2 receptors. Okay, so it acts as an antihistamine. So I was right. Okay. Woo! You know, once you're kind of of a certain age, your memory starts doing really funky things. Another oral medication that they can give you is hydroxyzine, which is also an antihistamine. Uh, I took this medication for about eight or nine years. The, the, one of the nice things about hydroxyzine is it has what we call a beneficial side effect. It, it has a very mild anti-anxiety effect. So an antihistamine, but when we think about phenotyping, an antihistamine is going to be the most effective for somebody who has allergies. I had a lot of allergies back then, especially seasonal allergies and or anybody with a bladder wall deficiency where urine is getting into the wounds and provoking mast cells to release histamine. And then last but not least, pentosin polysulfate, also known as Elmeron, is the only oral approved medication for IC. Um, however, it is now linked to two really substantial adverse events. One is retinal disease and the other is inflammatory bowel disease. And by the way, I have been looking for patients who have retinal disease who would like to talk confidentially with a national investigative reporter. There is, um, this is an incredible opportunity 
to educate others about interstitial cystitis. Our challenge here is that anybody in the lawsuits really need to be confidential. Uh, their attorneys have probably said, don't talk to a reporter. This is, uh, this is the cream of the crop when it comes to investigative reporting, and they uh, guarantee confidentiality. They will match your face, they will match your age, they will match voice, location, to make sure that nobody knows who you are. So if anybody's interested in doing that, uh, if you go uh, back onto our Facebook page or onto our Twitter page, I have her contact information. Her name is Jeannie. All right. So guideline statement number 15, clinicians should counsel patients who are considering Elmeron about the potential risk for macular damage and vision-related uh, injuries. And this is one that I have a little bit of a problem with because um, there are doctors out there who are minimizing this retinal disease. And they're saying, well, I haven't seen this in my practice. I think it's safe. Well, if you look at our data, I've got 2,000 patients in our study. And you look at now the many, many studies that have been published in medical journals. Um, you know, the medical journals say 20 to 25% of patients using Elmeron report retinal disease, our study is at the 50% range. And so for anybody who says this is not a big deal, I'm going to beg to disagree. Um, and if you talk to any of these patients who have severe eye damage and or are blind now, they are furious. And they wanted to know this is called informed consent. This is why we talk about this. You deserve and you have the right to know the risks of a treatment you're trying, right? Okie dokie, artichokey. Last but not least, oral cyclosporin A may be offered for patients with Hunter's lesions refractory to fulguration and or triamcinolone. Cyclosporin suppresses the immune system. And cyclosporin has indeed become kind of a wonder drug for patients with very, very severe IC who are not getting better, and especially patients with Hunter's lesions. Uh, the challenge with cyclosporin is it has a lot of potential uh, adverse events. Uh, and you're going to have to read about that, high blood pressure being one of them. So this is Odds are your urologist is not, they might prescribe it, but they're not going to monitor it. They're going to send you to another doctor who specializes in immune disorders to monitor your progress on cyclosporin. Okay. Um, Ashley says here, I just had a test come back positive for UTI and I don't, and I don't know the pain is so bad even after the second day on antibiotics. Are there any current trials occurring? Oh, there's always clinical trials occurring. We can look them up in a bit. Um, uh, you know, Ashley, what they're supposed to do is culture it out or do a next generation test to try to identify the most effective antibiotic to kill that specific infection. So we're, they're not supposed to be saying, oh, look, we think you have an infection. Here's a broad spectrum sulfa to take. We, are, we now know that a lot of bacteria are now resistant to sulfa. And so today, given the high incidence of drug resistant infections, doctors are supposed to be making better decisions about antibiotics based upon test results. So did they do a urine culture? It came back from the culture and it's E. coli. So when they do the culture, they're supposed to do an antibiotic sensitivity test to identify which bacteria will kill that specific E. coli. So did they do that? So, and Ashley says, but this is your second infection. So uh, as we talked about just a couple minutes ago, for women who get recurring infections, it's often the result of skin health and estrogen atrophy. So Ashley, how old are you, hun? How old are you? All right, let me keep going here. Okay, guideline statement number 17. There's only a handful more, guys. Intravesical installations. An intravesical installation is a bladder treatment. It's where we put medication directly into your bladder with a catheter. And there are three types of intravesical installations. One is called DMSO. And DMSO comes from the paper industry. It's a wood solvent. Um, 
it's been on its way out for years, to be quite honest, because the side effects are pretty significant, um, uh, including a lot of pain. You never, ever, ever dry, try to drive home from the doctor's office holding DMSO or any bladder installation. Uh, I did that. Whoa, what a mistake. Um, the dwell time really is 15 to 20 minutes. You got to hold it at the doctor's office. If you need to wait in a waiting room, wait in the waiting room, pee it out, then get in the car and drive home. Um, heparin is a coating. And so heparin can be a bit soothing, a bit protective, and lidocaine or marcaine are numbing agents. So the most popular installations are actually what we call rescue installations. It's a combination of those. There's going to be a little bit of heparin, a little bit of lidocaine, a little bit of sodium bicarbonate, a little bit of steroid, a little bit of antibiotic to try to calm your bladder down. And uh, rescue installations are really ideal for patients who are in flares and are bladder wall driven. Okay, so we're going back to Ashley now on YouTube. So Ashley, you're 54. So you're definitely in estrogen atrophy. And so, and the fact that you've had two infections in six months or three in a year puts you firmly in the recurring UTI group. And so in addition to the antibiotic, they would normally also be giving you estrogen to use vaginally to start to improve your skin health. Because as long as your skin is dry, the bacteria are going to walk right in and infect those cells. We got to get that skin wet again. Uh, Ashley says, what's the percentage of people who have had successful results from D-Manos? I don't know off the top of my head. Not a lot. Um, the better combination is proanthocyanidins in D-Manos. And the one that I that we have is called... Prevent. Prevent. By natural approach and nutrition. Really... The top two supplements to prevent, uh, to try to prevent E. coli is Allura or Prevent, but Prevent's about half the price. <coughs> Boy, I'm talking a lot. My throat is dry. It's that right tonsil. Man, when my right tonsil starts to get prickly, ah. I need some honey. I got to put some honey in this. Okie dokie. Uh, Cheryl, hydroxazine. Hydroxazine, like a hydrox cookie, which is another name for an Oreo. Hydrox. All right. Here's the last couple. <coughs> Procedures. Number 18, cystoscopy under anesthesia with a short duration, low pressure hydrodistension may be undertaken as a treatment option. The, the important words there, short, low pressure, short duration. Back in the old days, they thought the more you stretch the bladder and the longer you hold fluid in there and really stretch the bladder out, the better. But it turns out that damages the bladder and some bladders actually rupture. If you ever had a hydrodistension and went home with a catheter, that means that your bladder was ruptured. Sometimes they don't tell you that, but that's not normal. Number 19, if hundreds lesions are present, then fulguration and or injection of triamcinolone should be performed. In other words, if they find the lesion, it needs to be treated. But we have some newly emerging treatments like hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which is always looking good. But remember, the number one cause of severe pain over time is an untreated Hunter's lesion. So we want to get those, you know, treated. Number 20, intradetruser, detruser, Botox A may be administered if other treatments have not provided adequate improvement in symptoms. But the patient must be willing to accept the possibility that after treatment, they may need to self-catheterize. So Botox acts to silence nerves. You know, people get Botox, you know, to, you know, to get, prevent the forehead wrinkles, right? 
Well, Botox can be used for TMJ. It can be used for all sorts of things. And they do use it in the bladder. But the challenge is, is when they inject it in the bladder, and we we just had a study that basically showed location didn't matter, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I just wrote it for a magazine. Um, Anyway, as they inject the Botox into the bladder wall, if they accidentally silence the nerve that controls your ability to urinate on command, yikes. <laughs> what that means then is you're going to need to use a catheter to empty your bladder for a period of time until the Botox wears off. It might be a couple of weeks, could be a couple months. You know, it does wear off. But our challenge here is do you have the ability to do that? You know, Botox has been kind of pushed in elder care facilities as a way, you know, I mean, think about it. Imagine here you've got a 90 year old woman in assisted living, very, very dry bladder. They're giving her coffee every morning. I worked with a patient that way. She called me crying for help because they didn't believe her. They gave her, they gave her coffee and orange juice every, or, or cranberry juice every single morning for her quote bladder issues. They didn't know about IC and she was insane with pain. She was crying. She was screaming. They started sedating her. And finally, I I worked with the dietitian at the facility and said, do you know what interstitial cystitis is? Do you know what estrogen atrophy? And she said, no, I don't. I went, this is a wounded bladder wall. This is a bladder wall that's vulnerable because this patient is so old, they don't have the estrogen and now it's dry. So you know how painful dry dry mouth is? Well, dry bladder is just as painful. And the worst thing you can do to this patient is give her a cup of coffee and cranberry juice in the morning. And we had a bit of a showdown on the phone because that's one of my passions is helping patients who cannot help themselves. And um, it worked and they stopped giving her coffee and they stopped giving her cranberry juice and orange juice every morning and she got better. They didn't have to trank her. And what was amazing is she lived another five years and she actually remembered me in her will. And she gave me, it's the only time this has ever happened. She gave me $5,000 in her will. And her son called and told me that. And I was just stunned. And she said, Jill, you were the only one who listened to her. You were the only one who helped her. She would have been in agony for the rest of her life if you had not stepped in and helped. So you deserve this from our family. Thank you. And that was very, very cool. I got to turn my heater on. It is cold. All right. Oh, you guys, I have something to demo, too. Ooh, so let me get through these real quick, and then I've got something kind of quirky to show you. Okay, 21, a trial of neuromodulation may be performed if other treatments have not provided adequate symptom control and quality of life improvement. If a nerve stimulation, nerve stimulation is successful, then a permanent neurostimulation device may be implanted. This is called interstem, although they have other names, too. And that's where they use a very gentle electronic pulse to the nerves uh, to try to re-regulate dysfunctional nerves in the bladder. We have a lot of information on this website. Neuromodulation, especially surgical neuromodulation, is not for the faint of heart. It can be very, very expensive. It's a very important that even if your doctor says it's covered, don't believe it. You need to call the facility where you're going to have the surgery. You need to call the company and get in writing that it is covered. If they are unwilling to put it in writing, don't do it. As one patient learned, she was told by her doctor's office, by the hospital, and by the company it was covered. A week after surgery, she got a bill for $80,000 and a threat to garnish her wages because she happened to work at the hospital. And she said, hey, you told me it was covered. And they went, well, we're sorry we were wrong. Get it in writing. We don't want that to happen again. Um. Major surgery, guideline statement number 22, major surgery. So bladder augmentation, urinary diversion, and or bladder removal may be undertaken in carefully selected patients with bladder-centric symptoms 
or in the rare instance when there is an end stage, very small fibrotic bladder for whom all other therapies have failed. Now, bladder surgery is really very, very rare. And it's really reserved for patients um, whose bladders are very, very shrunken uh, or bladder, patients who have Hunter's lesions that are just not responding to therapy. They can actually resect the lesion out, just cut it out, or they can actually uh, remove the bladder they can divert urine from your bladder uh, to a stoma. There are a number of things that they can do, but again, really, really rare. And now that we have phenotyping, and now we're not gonna waste time doing treatments that are ineffective, we're really not gonna see a lot of surgery happen. One of the things the guideline says is that it's very, very important that the surgeon be highly, highly skilled. You do not want a first timer doing bladder removal. You need somebody like Dr. Robert Evans or Robert Muldwin who have been doing this for decades, do this surgery because it is very complex, long surgery, very long recovery time. You will need a lot of help if you choose to have that done. Okay, treatments that should not be offered, long-term oral antibiotics. Why? Because we're not finding bacteria at least pathogenic bacteria, although we're starting to find a funky lactobacillus, but in general, long-term antibiotics are, should not be offered. Number 24, intravesical BCG should not be offered. Uh, BCG is a cancer treatment. They, uh, it's a deactivated tuberculin uh, bac uh, bacteria. Uh, it's used for bladder cancer. It can strip off the bladder lining. They had hoped that it would be helpful for IC. It failed all those studies. Number 25, high pressure, long duration hydrodistension should not be done. And number 26, systemic uh, steroid should not be done. All right, those are our guidelines. Those are our guidelines. And you can find those over on the IC Network website. Let me come back to your questions here. Um, okay, so getting back to Ashley. Well, okay, the skin is dry. Uh, can you spell that? Um, estrogen atrophy. Well, you just spelled that estrogen. Do you know how much should be used daily, vaginally daily? It depends upon how dry your skin is. Huh? That's why you need to have a doctor look at it. For some patients, it might be three times a week. For some, it might be two weeks. And for others, it might be every day. One of the things that they often do is they'll have you do it every day for two or three weeks just to saturate the tissue with estrogen, and then you drop it back down to two or three times a week. Hi, Jennifer. Jennifer says, I had postmenopausal bleeding for about five days at the beginning of October. After calling my doctor, she had me at pelvic ultrasound. In her office, she realized, hold on. Oh, you lost me on YouTube. Oh, well, it looks good on my end. Um, so she ha they did a pelvic ultrasound that week. In her office, she realized what? What did they find in the office? Did you have endometrial hyperplasia? Did they find a thickened endometrial layer in your uterus, which is very common as we get older? All right, let me check YouTube here real quick. I mean, Facebook here. And you guys, listen, if I miss your question, ask it again. Don't take it personally. It just, I'm looking all over the place and I miss stuff. It's don't take it personally. Just be this be the squeaky wheel as i say in my office be the squeaky wheel if you don't hear back from me call me again okay hold on a sec florence says my urologist wants to use dmso what are the side effects dmso uh, has a lot of potential side effects so it, it, dmso is a byproduct of the wood uh, pulp industry or paper industry. Um, it was originally thought back in the late, so here's, here's Florence, let me give you the whole history here so that you really understand that. Back in the 1950s, they were looking for ways to move kidneys for kidney transplant. Because, so you've got one patient in one hospital who's donating a kidney, you've got another patient an hour away who's receiving that kidney. How do we get Kid, that kidney from point A to point B healthy. Well, if you freeze it, the ice crystals damage and destroy the kidney. So you cannot freeze it. You cannot expose it to great, great cold. 
somebody at some point in time figured out that you could put it in DMSO and you could carry it from one facility to another. And so back in the early 1960s, DMSO was really thought to be a bit of a wonder drug. They thought it would treat a lot of conditions. I actually interviewed the guy who, let's see, it wasn't Alfred Globus. Who was it? It was a guy up in Oregon. Was it him? I, I interviewed the guy who actually wrote the, um, the patient education materials and submitted it for FDA approval. So they tested it for a lot of diseases. It failed every single disease, tiny, tiny bit of effectiveness for IC. Therefore, the FDA decided to approve it for IC. The challenge is that they really don't know what it does. Uh, aside from the fact that it's a very deep penetrant, it can pass through the bladder wall and get deeper into tissues. Because you got to remember your bladder wall is hydrophobic. That bladder wall is supposed to push urine away so urine doesn't get into the cells. So how do we get a medication across that hydrophobic barrier? Um, and so GMSO turned out to be quite a good penetrant. But back in the early 2000s, a researcher named C. Suba Packer did a, some research on DMSO to try to figure out what it was doing. And it has many different potential methods of action. Um, but one of the things that she found at the 50 per, FDA approved dose of 50% is that it caused irreversible bladder spasms, muscle spasms, irreversible in some not everybody, but in some. So she presented this data two years in a row. And I was there, it was in Los Angeles in an AUA meeting. And so I saw the data, it didn't surprise me at all because I found DMSO to be very painful when I did it. And I did the FDA approved dose of 58 times myself. Um, um, I went around the room to the other IC experts and I said, so what do you think about the DMSO research? What do you think of that? What do you think this? What do you think this? Well, it turned out that the, it triggered this fascinating discussion at this meeting of all the IC experts in the world. And Dr. Ray Rackley of the Cleveland Clinic stood up and said, we don't use DMSO in our clinic at all because we believe that it, that it does so much damage to the bladder that some of these patients have to have their bladders removed. So he stood up very boldly and said, we think it's damaging, we will not use it. But then another doctor, it was Chris Payne actually at Stanford said that there are some cases where DMSO is appropriate, but that it should be used in a cocktail formula with other medications like heparin, like lidocaine, that reduces the overall dosage from 50% to 25%. And so that has become the standard for DMSO use is that it's not used by itself. It's normally used in a cocktail form. So um, other side effects, uh, you, a stinky garlic smell that oozes out of your pores um, and bladder pain. Those are really going to be the two dominant ones. So some people have it done. They go home and their family goes, ooh, what'd you do? Take a garlic shower? right? Um, it didn't happen to me, but that, that's, a, that's very, very common. So Florence, I think what I would do if I were you is come on over to the IC Network website, icnetwork.org, and go to, our risk, go to our bladder installation page. And we have all the published formulas for bladder installations. And you can print that out and you can take that to your doctor and say, oh, I don't really want to do straight DMSO. Uh, because it's really rarely done now. But the concept of a rescue installation that will rescue out of a flare, something with heparin and lidocaine, maybe a little tiny bit of DMSO to help it move through the bladder wall, is fine. Okay, so how is that for a long answer? Uh, Kathleen said, hyperbaric oxygen therapy does work. Medicare will not pay for it. Medicaid will or find a place who treats off-label diagnoses. Do not go to Mexico for treatments. Please, people, do not go to Mexico for any IT treatments. Seriously. 
Uh, Kathleen said, some of the urologists administer DMS show insults here in Atlanta where I moved three years ago and I'm trapped. Hey, Kathleen, you're the boss. You're the boss. You pay them. They don't pay you. And our guidelines absolutely say shared decision making. That's what the guidelines say. If you're not comfortable with DMSO, you don't have to do DMSO. You can have a, a heparin lidocaine treatment instead. I wouldn't do DMSO now. There's just, there's just no... Uh, today, it's all about phenotyping. Florence said, why is DMS so bad? It's painful. And we've got two studies showing that it can be damaging to tissue. Bobby says, hey, Kayleen. Uh, I'm definitely thinking of issues or more pelvic, pelvic floor driven. Doctor mentioned my genitofemoral nerve is the issue and my psoas is extremely tight. Honey, I see subtype four, pudendal neuralgia. You fit it perfectly. It is muscle and nerve for you. Kathleen said, and that's what your doctor said. Kathleen said, I've only had the Parsons instills for two years in Denver. My bladder is light pink and look great. Now here, my bladder looks angry and inflamed. No cancer. Installations are not helping. So Kathleen, um, um, if you'd like to call me this week, I'd love to talk with you. We can kind of get into it a little bit better. Um, that's I would consider that quite odd. You were doing well in Denver. Your bladder was in great shape. Now, but now that you've moved to the Atlanta area, you're not doing as well. So we would be looking at, at are your muscles super tight from stress, restricting, uh, a blood flow to your bladder? Are you older and now in estrogen atrophy? Or are you eating, drinking water, a different type of water that might be more alkaline or more acidic and damaging your bladder wall? Or are you eating new foods? You know, I mean, the bladder is, it's very reflective of um, our overall health. Um, if you're under massive levels of stress, you're going to pee more. I mean, that's the way the nerves work. They're preparing you because you're in fight or flight. Uh, you know, part of fight or flight is to get this person to pee and poop so that, so that they can get ready to fight. Mary says, is estradiol sufficient? It can be. It usually is. Kayleen, I have a question. My body has obviously been adjusting to something new. I had a bladder instill on Thursday. I had trouble maneuvering the catheter. I was so embarrassed because I swear my urine, my urine projected all over his uncovered arms. <laughs> what could prevent that from happening again? It sounds like his technique was a little flawed. I mean, you weren't straining. The only other thing that kind of comes to mind is, I mean, it's a high pressure environment. Were you straining? Florence says, DMSO, good or bad? Marginal. That's how I would answer it. Kathleen said, I should have clarified I'm trapped as my Jeep was totaled in March of 2021. That kind of trapped. I only have the Parsons in still. Well, you know, and again, Kathleen, you're not, you're, you're, symptomatic and we need to figure out why you're symptomatic and try to treat that right becky says here on youtube we well, here hold on jennifer says i had postmenopausal bleeding five days at the beginning of october calling my doctor she had me do a pelvic ultra ultrasound it's happened three times within a three-year period of time. Then on October 31st, I'm having a hysteroscopy to figure out why it is happening to me. I have a clitoral adhesion. Okay, here, hold on. Okay, so Jennifer, absolutely the right thing to do. I had a hysteroscopy. And it's very important that they look in your uterus and they see anything funky. Do you have a polyp in there that's bleeding? One of the things that happens as we get older, think about your period for a moment. Think about when you're younger and fertile. 
So every month, your, your uterus prepares itself to receive an egg and nurture a baby, right? And so your endometrial lining gets thicker as your estrogen levels increase. But then the baby doesn't arrive. Your hormone levels change, you know, progesterone dominant, and you have a period to slough off that thickened tissue, right? And as we women have gone through, you know, periods are absolutely inevitable and they're a must because if you don't have a period, things get thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker. And that's basically what happens with menopause is that with the loss of estrogen, I mean, with, you still have a little bit of estrogen. So you're still, that's that, that um, endometrium is still getting a little bit thicker, but you don't have the progesterone so much anymore. So you're not having periods to let it go. So the endometrial lining can get thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker. So, um, and sometimes a polyp can grow. But the reason why they're doing the hysteroscopy for you, just like they did for me, is they need to take a closer look at that endometrial lining. Because sometimes what happens is the endometrial lining becomes atypical. There are normal cells and abnormal cells. So they're going to look for they're going to they're going to look for that polyp but they're going to look for abnormal cells because it's the abnormal cell that can actually become cancer and cancer is a really scary word um it's like you're it's so shocking i i mean listen how many of you of, of us and i cuz i don't think that there are any guys in here right now so we can be kind of blunt um, if there are, tell me guys, wave your hands. Um, but for, for we women, you know, when you have your, um, your mammogram, nobody likes having a mammogram, but then what's worse is you get a call the next day saying, mm, we think we saw something. We need you to come back. And you're immediately frightened going, What? Yeah, we want to take a second look. We think we saw something in your left breast. And immediately the floor drops out. Like you're like, oh my God. Oh my God. Could this be cancer? And you carry this deep, deep fear until they can actually go. And you go back and they do another one. And or they do a little sonogram and you find out, ah, oh, it's a cyst, just no big deal. Right? And it's like, oh, thank God. Right? Um, and that's quite common. That happened to me the last time. That's happened to me two times uh, with my last mammograms. And they were like, yeah, we, can, we can't get you in for another four weeks. And I'm like, now, wait a second. You're telling me you think I have a cancer. So you now have me having a massive panic attack because you think I have cancer and you expect me to wait a month? No. I want an appointment in the next 48 hours. I'm like, ma'am, we're sorry. I, I don't care. I want an appointment in the next 48 hours. You have just given me the worst news of my life. I want an answer quickly. Okay. So, you know, the hysteroscopy is kind of the same thing. It's good. They just get in there, take a quick look. Let's see what we got. And hopefully it's absolutely nothing. And if it's not, then, you know, then they're probably going to want to do a DNC. I had a DNC next because I had spotting. And my DNC culture, uh, a biopsy did show precancer cells. And I ended up having a hysterectomy. And I'm damn glad we found it and we got rid of it. She says, a year or two ago, I had a hysterectomy. Oh, wait a second. Oh, wait a second. So you've already had a hysterectomy and you're bleeding? Or was it a hysteroscopy? She, so she took an instrument and she moved the polyps, but she didn't remove your uterus. Okay, well, 
anyway, hon, I'm, I've been there sending you lots of love, be strong and just know that this is so common and good. It's good to know one way or the other. So no shame, no blame. Uh, G J O P says I'm having high inflammation due to low iron being low. You're being told to take a multi, but you can't do vitamin C or citric acid. Can you explain the dis the different acids like citric, et cetera, and are all of them triggering? So, um, number one, we have a low acid multivitamin called Bladder Smart. Uh, I take it myself. I took it last night before I went to bed. Um, so Bladder Smart low acid vitamin in the ICN shop is an excellent vitamin for people who are very, very bladder sensitive. So I would encourage you to consider that. The two most irritating, well, the three most irritating acids are going to be ascorbic acid from vitamin C citric acid from citrus fruits and used often used to stabilize juices and acetic acid and vinegar. But ascorbic acid and citric acid are going to be the most irritating ones. So most people cannot, most ICRs, anybody with bladder wall sensitivity are not going to do well with citrus fruits. Florence says, now I'm not sure what to do. Florence, it begins with your, your education. I want you to go over to icnetwork.org and read the section on bladder installations. It's hard to make a decision if you don't have all the information. So go read the information. It's right on our website. And our website has been rated the best on the web in two medical studies, one by uh, Children's Hospital Harvard, the other by the University of London. So go to icnetwork.org. Go to the treatment area, go to the bladder installation area, but even more importantly, go read the phenotyping area. You gotta phenotype you, you gotta figure out what group you're in. Carol says, I'm so happy I had this support from you and all of us need a voice. I've been so upset that my bladder doctor is really not there for me. Ask about different pain medications as I heard from the group in you, he won't give them to me. He, I feel he really does not know about IC. I need to try to find a doctor that knows. Well, you know, uh, there are so many things I could say to you, Carol, but I think the single most important concept that you need to focus on is the concept of cause versus effect. The symptoms are the effect. The pain is the effect. We have to figure out underlying cause because we need to fix the underlying cause so you're no longer in pain. And you as a pain patient, you have to be where whoever you're working with, with doctor-wise, and you're talking about pain, your message always has to be, I want to figure out what's causing the pain so that I don't have to use pain meds because that proves intent and that proves that you're not a, a drug seeker. There are people who absolutely abuse meds. There's no doubt about it. Um, you're going to that doctor because you're trying to solve the mystery of your pain. You want to know where the pain is coming from. So um, um, if it's the bladder wall, if you have pain on bladder fill, then doing the numbing agent like pyridium or azo would be reasonable. If you are uh, um, in the central sensitization nerve sensitivity group, um, then doing something like the over-the-counter supplement PEA, Pura, might be very good at calming the nerves down that are triggering pain. Of course, that low-dose antidepressant is also very, very helpful for treating pain over time. But for that breakthrough pain, for that moment when you're sobbing in pain, you're up in the middle of the night, laying in the fetal position in your bathroom, that's kind of an opiate moment, but medical marijuana, uh, listen, pain is the enemy. I just don't want you to chase the, the, I don't want you to keep treating the pain. I want you to also be focused on what's causing the pain so we can fix that in the first place. Um, Kayleen says it might've been his fault because he had, he had turned too much. Poor guy though. It's, he's like, this isn't my first golden shower. Oh my God. That's funny. 
I love the language you use. Golden showers. Golden showers means that you're being sprayed with urine. And some people find that to be a turn on, which is crazy. So there are people out there who do that. I don't do that. <laughs> that makes no sense to me. But of course, anybody who's cared for a new baby, especially a little boy, odds are you've suffered golden showers many a time. Um, uh, GJOP, that's because I see some of the some of the potassiums have an acid, and I know years ago they tested me with potassium, so that's the same. Um, so Gwen, um, here's the deal. Um, the potassium sensitivity test has been thrown out as meaningful. Uh, potassium is a salt, potassium chloride. What's one of the earliest forms of torture but rubbing salt into an open wound? So the only information that the potassium sensitivity test gave us is that your bladder wall was potentially damaged but it, did, it doesn't tell us why. And it also is such an overwhelming amount of potassium, it's pretty much gonna make any bladder scream, whether it's estrogen atrophy or God forbid Hunter's lesions. Putting a salt into a Hunter's lesion would be agony. So that's not used as a diagnostic test anymore. And so I don't think you really need to worry about that. Everybody's a little bit different. I mean, but interestingly in the diet studies, <clears throat> bananas, which are high in potassium, are actually found to be quite soothing. <clears throat> and the only people who seem to have a problem with bananas are people with big open lesions that haven't been treated. <clears throat> hmm. You know, I had the COVID vaccine on um, last when did I have it? A week ago, last Wednesday. And it was, it was a little bit different for me. Like I felt great until I woke up at like 1.30 in the morning and I was shaking uncontrollably. I was so cold. My, my jaw was chattering. Like it would have been a perfect effect for Halloween. And um, I just... So I was really cold for about 24 hours and I had to, I had a heating pad stuck in, stuck in my shirt most of the day. Um, and then I kind of had a good day and then I just felt very weak in the knees, um, very kind of shaky. And that lasted six days. Um, I'm really glad I did it because all the new long COVID data is really quite you know, alarming. Florence says, you went to the website and clicked, but the bladder still didn't come. Here, hold on. Let me go there and I'll give you the direct link. So hold on a sec. It's under IC Information Center and then you go to treatment and it's right here. It's a big pull down menu. But if you're on a, a phone it's or a pad, it's a little bit harder to find. There you go, hon. There's your link. Gwen says, they the doctor refused to give opiates. I've tried two pain clinics and they still don't help. Um, Donna's getting a COVID shot next week. Yeah, I don't have any regrets. I'm very invested in wanting to keep my body very, very strong. I mean, the problem with COVID is it attacks blood vessels. It reproduces in arteries and blood vessels. And so blood clots are common. They think that pretty much everybody who's had COVID has what we call micro clots, little, lots of little tiny clots throughout their body that aren't harmful per se. But for some people, some people get big clots that cause strokes and heart attacks and lose arms and legs because that big clot blocks blood flow. So I'm very, very invested in wanting to keep my brain healthy and my body healthy. Um, so Gwen, so this is the way I would approach it. So I have a couple of different ways I, I approach doctors about this. Um, rather than asking for pain medicine, what you should do is explain how your life is limited. So doctor, I can't get out of bed more than once a day. All I can do is go to the bathroom. 
I can't cook a meal. I can't clean my house. I can't do the laundry and I can't go to work. Or if it's not that severe, you can say, doctor, listen, I can be up during the day, but the pain is so severe. I can't concentrate. I can't do my work. All I can think about is the pain. It's just pulsing down there. So it's interfering with my ability to function. I can't get in a car. I can't sit. I can't go to church. It hurts too much to sit in the pews. Sometimes you have to paint the picture of how your life is limited by, show, by talking about your ability to do basic life functions. And then your question is, what can we do to improve my ability to function? And you let them say, mm, maybe we need a little bit of pain management here. So concept no, number one is to make your case by talking about your functionality and how it's limited. Then the second thing is you have to understand the different types of opiate medication. There are short-acting opiates like Norco, which are only active for three hours. You know, it's a four, you, you take it every four hours, supposedly. Uh, why? Because it's, it's, it's easy, it's quick in and it's quick out. Um, in contrast to something like uh, OxyContin, which is a time-release opiate that's going to work over a 12-hour period of time. And of course, you cannot cut time-release medications in half because if you do, you will overdose because as soon as you cut it in half, you've broken through that, that um, coating of the pill that helps it be time-release. And now all that medication is going to dump into your bloodstream and you're going to overdose. So you never cut time-release medications in half. But for something like Norco, where when you get it, there's a score down the middle. Anytime a medication has a score down the middle, that means usually means you can cut it in half. And so what you could do is you could, and this is what I've done very successfully, say, listen, doc, I'm not interested in more than a 10-day supply because this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to cut each pill in half. I might even cut it in quarters. Uh, my goal here is to catch the pain early, a little bit of pain med, so I'm not letting it get out of control. And I think you and I can agree that if you give me 10 Norco, I am not going to become a raving addict on 10 Norco. I chaired the State of California Pain Conference many years ago. And also testified up in Sacramento as we were passing um, a law called the Pain Patients Bill of Rights. And an addict is somebody who's taking pain medication to escape life and escape their responsibility to get high. The correct use of pain medication is somebody who's using it so they can function. They're not interested in escaping. They want to be a good employee. They want to be a good parent. They want to be able to make dinner for their children. They want to be able to go to school and watch a softball game. So that's another way of looking at it. Are you taking it to escape life or are you taking it so that you can truly function? We have a very good section on pain care on the IC Network website in our, in our, our book, IC 101. It's not just a bladder disease. I would encourage you to read both of those. I think that you would find those very, very helpful. Um, when I take pain meds, I mean, I learned I only took one, one Vicodin once and, my, and the, room, the room spun. But that was not an allergy. That was a sensitivity. That was too much. And I have a degree in pharmacology drug development. So I knew that. And because it had a score in the middle, I cut it in half. And the next time I took it, it's like, okay, the room is not spinning and the pain is under control. But I still felt a little off. So the next time I took it, I cut it in quarters. And that was perfect for me. A quarter of a, of a Norco turned off the pain was not sedating, and I nipped that sucker in the bud. Nobody could ever accuse me of being a drug user for using one quarter of a narco during a flare. And I will say, nine times out of ten, that was enough, and the flare was done. 
because I caught it very, very early. If you wait until your pain is out of control and you're crying, you've allowed your entire central nervous system to get involved, and we've amped that entire pain response up. So it's about trying to catch pain early, early, early. All right, Gwen said, let's see. I'm in Phoenix. There are a few doctors here that do the potassium, I guess. What I was asking was the additive in the food, potassium acid. You know, everybody's a little different. You're just going to have to try it and see how you do it. Um, for the most part, a very, very little bit of potassium is not a problem. And you're 64, so you're in estrogen atrophy, so your bladder wall is definitely more vulnerable. Uh, Gwen says, I was told last week at the pain clinic that because I do, you do a Valium, uh, they refuse to help. Well, would they have helped if you switch that Valium to Baclofen? Um, I mean, if you've got tight pelvic floor muscles, using a muscle relaxant is perfectly normal. And you, you may do one ml every few weeks um, uh, for spasm. Thank you, honey. She says you're a blessing. Thank you. I try. Delisa, hello, Delisa. She says, I'm new here, recently diagnosed with IC. So much pain constantly. Azo only worked at first, not so much now. All right. Well, Delisa, maybe you can be our, our case study for this meeting today. So uh, do you want me to try to phenotype you? And let's see if we can get to the root cause. Take about five minutes if you're willing to ask some questions, answer some questions. Yeah, so I need a yes. Okay, so so Delisa, how old are you? How old are you now? Age is very important here. I really need to know how old you are because that tells me where your hormone levels are. Okay, and how old? She's 56. How old were you when your symptoms started? Is this recent or does this go back in time? For anybody who's called and talked to me, you recognize these questions, right? Okay, so how old were you when your symptoms started? This year? Recently. How long ago, hon? Couple of weeks, couple of months, how long ago? Four months. Okay, is there any event that you associate with the onset of your symptoms? What happened four months ago? Were you traveling? Did you have COVID? Did you fall? Did anything happen? What do you think? Is there anything you think that played a role in the onset of your symptom? Gwen says, I have I, the IC101 book. It's a great book. They just gave me triazinidine. You can't do baclofed due to seizures. Okay. Okay, so we're back with Delisa. Is there any event that you associate with the onset of your symptoms? Four months ago, would have been early summer. Were you traveling? Did you take a long car ride? Uh, did you fall? Anything that did you think anything played a role in this? You, well, your knowledge is important here. It's going to help us. She must be writing something. So we're waiting for Delisa. So we are expecting thunderstorms. So it'll be very interesting to see if I have power in a couple of hours. They say we could have thunderstorms time. So we're just waiting for Delisa.
Delisa, are you still here? Oh, here she is. Oh, yeah, she wrote something along. No event, just working like normal. I did have surgery when I was like two on my bladder and kidneys where they rerouted my tubes. Lived for years with kidney infections. Nothing I can think of played a role. Just kept feeling like I had an infection. And they finally did a cystoscopy and said I had IC. They tried putting me on an antihistamine and I had an allergic reaction the first dose and I can't take that. Okay, so Delisa, uh, did you have a pelvic floor assessment? Have you had a, well, okay, hold on. Before you even answer that question, let's talk about your symptoms for a moment. Um, do, when is your pain the worst? Before you urinate, when your bladder's really full, during urination, or after you're done urinating? When is your pain the worst? Before, during, or after urination? So in other words, as your bladder gets fuller and fuller, does the pain get worse and worse and worse? And do you feel a sense of, oh, thank God, when you empty your bladder, does the pain go away? Or does the pain get worse after you're done urinating? Oh, God, I have my demo. Oh. <laughs> Okay. Delisa says, it's all day pain, constant. I'm in the bathroom constantly. It's what, What's funny is if I literally go outside and squat, I can pee better than when I sit on the toilet. Almost seems like I need to have a camping life. So sitting on a toilet actually is kind of the worst way to pee because what it does is it, it kind of torques your pelvic floor muscles. The human body is actually designed to squat, for, especially for bowel movements. That's why things like the squatty potty are so useful, because when you put your knees up a little bit, it opens up the pelvic floor, it opens up the tube, and it makes urination a lot easier. Um, so let me ask you this. We didn't really... Does the pain change at all with urination? So in other words, is it super bad when it's full and does it get better when you empty or is it worse afterwards? Okay, so I have something funky to share. So we're working with Delisa, but I'm going to do show and tell now too. So I got this yesterday. And... Um, so here's the package. And I didn't remember what I had ordered. And this is what came. And I'm like, what is that? What did I order? And then I opened it. Okay. Okay. So let's get back to Delisa. Okay. My doctor said, told me I could just live on Azo. It's not working anymore. Okay, Lisa, let's, let's try this a different way. When you try to urinate, does your stream right, start right away or do you hesitate 5, 10, 5, 10, 15, 20 seconds before you can relax enough to release urine? Can you pee on command? Do you pee like a horse? Or is it stopping and starting, stopping and starting? And does it take a while sometimes to start? All right. So what is this? So again, this is what it looks like. You open it up and you get this. This is actually called the Millie. And it is a, uh, it will allow you to do internal pelvic floor massage. Oh, hold on a sec. Delisa says, and everybody get ready because you know what this is. 
I have to push hard to get anything out, and sometimes nothing comes out. All right, what do we know, guys? What does that mean? Your pelvic floor muscles are toast. Urination is about relaxation. You normally you sit down as a uh, muscle relaxes, a sphincter opens, and you pee instantaneously. But the problem is, is that if your muscles are super, super tight, they're not opening to allow you to empty. And that's, so one thing that's happening here is you probably have very, very, very tight pelvic floor muscles. And the problem here is that the more you push, the tighter it gets. And you're just making it worse. So let me get my model here real quick. Hold on. Oh, love just fell. Hey, you know it's not a support group meeting if something doesn't fall. <laughs> All right. So let us look at the pelvic floor here for a moment. Okay. So, so this is the front of your pelvis, obviously hip bone, hip bone. Here's your pubic symphysis, your pubic bone. You can see it's connected. Let's look at it from the back. Vertebrae, sacrum, tailbone. I want you to look at everything that touches the tailbone. Tailbone injuries are very common in the IC patient population. If you've got a tailbone that's swinging to the left, swinging to the right, or curving out instead of under, that could be one reason why muscles are very consistently tight and painful. But there's also three layers of muscles. See, if I put my finger in here where the vagina is, you can actually see that the muscles are actually pretty flat. They sit along the bone. And there are different layers of muscles. You got deep muscles, you got shallow muscles. So let's talk about the shallow muscles because it's the shallow muscles that are probably part of the problem here. So here's the shallow muscles. These are called the levator ani muscles. Okay, so um, what makes the, the pelvic floor muscles so incredibly different in the human body is that they're the only skeletal muscles to control major bodily functions because they basically have three holes. They have a hole for your urethra, they have a hole for, for your vagina, and they have a hole for your rectum. And you're gonna notice that the muscles wrap around all of those. So if these muscles are tight, what are they gonna do? They're gonna squeeze the urethra. We call that a urethral stricture. They're gonna squeeze the vagina, just gonna make it very difficult to have sex. And they're gonna squeeze the rectum, which is why having a bowel movement can be painful and why patients with tight pelvic floor muscles struggle with constipation. So concept number one for you, Delisa, is you definitely need a pelvic floor assessment. Because now we know, remember, we don't think of IC as a bladder disease anymore. We think of IC as a neuromuscular disorder that really for the great majority of us, there's not a bladder disease process happening, that our bladder is being victimized by something else. And the fact that you're straining proves that you're having a muscle problem. And so we need to get somebody to look at your pelvic floor muscles to see if they're healthy or not. But the second thing that we also have to ponder is your age and estrogen atrophy. And I call this the chicken versus the egg dilemma. Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? And for us, it's which comes first, the bladder or the pelvic floor. They're both involved. They cannot not both be involved. But one is normally driving the other. So the foundation for this could have been laid 10 years ago with a fall with muscles being injured, slowly getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And then something happened four or five months ago, which tweaked your muscles and locked them down. 
Or the other concept here um, is age. That at the age of 54, you are now in estrogen atrophy. You are. And the bladder needs estrogen to produce that nice thick coating of mucus. So think about your bladder. It's the only organ in the human body designed to hold toxic waste. So how can the bladder hold ammonia for hours and hours at a time and not get damaged? Oh, okay. Well, let me finish this and we're going to come back to what you just said. So how does so how does the bladder hold ammonia and not get damaged? Well, it's because your bladder's very wet on the inside. There's a very thick, robust coating of mucus. And that mucus acts as a barrier. It protects everything. But it is estrogen dependent. So when you're young and have lots of estrogen, you got lots of mucus. At the age of 54, you don't have the estrogen. Therefore, you probably don't have as much mucus. That's your bladder's ability to defend itself is now compromised. So that cup of coffee you might have enjoyed in your 30s and 40s, all of a sudden in your 50s hurts like hell. That's not a bladder disease. That's dryness. And so the odds are you have both going on. You got some estrogen atrophy. The other thing that happens with estrogen atrophy is muscles get weaker. So every woman starts to dabble a little bit with, you know, various muscle symptoms down there. So Delisa just said something really, really important here. She says, well, that makes a lot of sense. I'm told I have a slight bulging vagina. Sex has been non-existent for about three years. It was painful when we did it. So it was either painful from dryness from estrogen atrophy or it was painful because you have very tight muscles. So Delisa, were you have you had children? Um and if you if you have were any of those deliveries difficult or have you had C-sections or were you an athlete when you were younger? Uh Gwen said um, hold on a sec. Uh, Jennifer says, I use my squatty potty almost every time I need to have a bowel movement. Excellent. I don't use mine as much. I should be using it more. Um, um, let's see here. Gwen says, that also happens when it burns more after I pee. So if you have burning on your skin after you urinate, that's estrogen atrophy. If you have burning deeper in your body, that's tight pelvic floor muscle. Um, and Gwen says, can you be too old to do estrogen cream? No, of course not. Okay, so while Delise is answering that question, let us, shall we explore the milli? <laughs> so this is a... Um, a wand, a pelvic wand that can be done internally. But what makes it so interesting is that it, it warms, it has a vibration, and it changes size. There's a little engine in it that will allow it to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So um, let me, okay, so that's the zero size. I'm going to I'm going to make it bigger. Yeah, that's a four, five. And so it's actually getting bigger right here. And it will go all the way up to a 25. So I don't know if you can see. Yeah, you see, you can see that getting a little bit bigger, right? Isn't that cool? Okay. And so now I'm going to drop it back down to a one. It has vibration. I don't. Can you hear that? Can you hear the vibration? And this is becoming kind of the trend now with um, pelvic floor work to really work with these muscles, having that little bit of vibration, having that little bit of heat, a little bit, nothing so that you would burn yourself. I mean, this is kind of an all-in-one device, and it's really, and there's different types of, I mean, different speeds of vibration. That way it turned it off, too. So um, they sent, the, I, I think I bought this. 
Uh, so I'll try it and see what it's like because my muscles are always funky. And I'll tell you if I like it or not. Okay, stop vibrating. Are you done? Okay. So this is called the Millie. So maybe we'll try to sell it in the IC Network shop. I have to refresh my memory. Okay, so getting back to Delisa, she had one C-section after five days in the delivery room. The sun was stuck in the pelvic bone. Second was natural, but it was a terrible delivery. He ripped me apart and they sewed me up too tight. Okay, so honey, Delisa, you are absolutely a pelvic floor patient. You know, that's what we see. There are a number of patients whose symptoms began after having a difficult childbirth. And you had two difficult childbirths. You had a C-section after five days of, of labor and your second one caused a terrible injury where they had to sew you up and they sewed you up too tight. So you should have been in pelvic floor physical therapy after those deliveries. Um, there is a fantastic website called uh, pelvicrehab.com where you can search by zip code and find a physical therapist near you who specializes in pelvic floor work. You need to go have a proper pelvic floor assessment. We need to see what's going on. And the fact that sex has been painful for three years, honey, that's not your bladder. That's your pelvic floor. Although you could be very dry too. Uh, Carolyn says, and, and Delisa, listen, aging happens. I mean, I'm 63. It's so weird because I feel 25. We have to be attentive to the quality and health of our skin. When you start getting dry down there, that will just make things a bit worse. And so if estrogen atrophy is not a big deal now, great, but you're going to want to get on it and start using a little bit of estrogen. Oh, that heater was hot. Uh, Bobby says, can it happen several years after childbirth? Absolutely, because the damage was done during childbirth, you're just asymptomatic, but the, the, but the muscles were injured during childbirth and it's what we call a latent injury. What's wrong with my hair here? All right. So it, sometimes it, it takes, generally what we see is multiple traumas over time. So starting going back in childhood, if you, suffer, if you fell on your tailbone, anything at all like that, you know, when you're young, muscles are very res resilient and you feel pretty good. Even if you have an injury, you might not know you have an injury, but then as you get older, more and more and more injuries happen, and then you start having sex, that can be difficult. Then you start having babies, that can be difficult. And then we look at traumas and aging, but we just tend to see a kind of a, a, a multiple trauma over time, resulting in what can be very, very severe pelvic floor injury. And the book that I recommend to everybody is, not here. Breaking through chronic pelvic pain. It's here somewhere. Oh, it's right here. It's up on the windowsill. Breaking through chronic pelvic pain. This is the book. This is the book to get for anybody with a history of muscle injury or dealing with muscle trauma. It is filled with successful case studies. It is a master class in pelvic anatomy. When you go to the physical therapist and they're working on you, laying on your back, I want you to be able to visualize exactly what they're touching by name. You have to know what these muscles are. You need to know their names, know their location, so that you can work to the best of your ability with the physical therapist. Listen, ladies and gents, we're long past the point of giving our doctors full control over our bodies. We don't do that anymore. We are equal participants. We walk in knowledgeable and informed. We know what a urethra is. We know what a bladder is. We know what a ureter is. 
We know that we have muscles here and muscles there and nerves here and there. You've got to know your anatomy to really have good discussions with your doctors. Elisa says, I'm going to see who we have locally and get an appointment. Thank you so much. I'll be following you. Any advice for the pain now? Heat, muscle relaxant. Um, uh, you know, try some heat. Um, we have on the IC Network website, um, these great heating pads. You see this? Fits right over your pelvis. Heat helps muscles relax. Um, if you can't start your stream right away, you could ask the doctor if he would give you some a muscle relaxant like Flexeril. Um, that might be helpful to try to get those muscles to relax and release, but you got to get and have that pelvic floor assessment quickly. And again, I, oh, so one last thing, Delisa. So there's one other thing. So again, we got the chicken versus the egg dilemma, bladder versus pelvic floor. For some people, it begins with a bladder problem and the muscles get tight to compensate for the pain caused by the bladder problem. So if you, for example, are going through chemotherapy, the chemicals of chemo are very painful, your muscles will get tight to protect you. Or if you've got a really bad UTI, your muscles will get tight because of the pain, right? So that's scenario number one is that it begins with a bladder trauma, muscles get tight. But there's a scenario number two, and that is for there are many patients who it's driven by the muscles first. Um, that early injury for me, it was uh, I was 14 and broke my tailbone and, and I was diagnosed with a urethral stricture, which is a very tight urethra. And they just slammed it open with a metal rod instead of going, gee, why is her urethra tight? Oh, yeah, because her muscles are tight because, oh, yeah, she broke her tailbone. Right. And so for 30 years, I did bladder treatments and nothing worked for me. What worked for me was finally working with the original muscle. My muscles have been tight for a very, very, very long time. Muscles respond beautifully to muscle therapy. So we want to get we want that proper muscle assessment. But there's just one thing with with estrogen atrophy. Let's just say, because we don't know. We don't know where you are. Um, one of the ways that the bladder, one of the things that happens when the bladder gets really, really irritated is a false sense of fullness. Where you will feel full. You feel like your bladder's bursting full and you go to the bathroom and nothing comes out. And, um, and so for a, a typical bladder wall flare, and there's two points I'm going to make with you. So typical bladder wall flare, let's say you go to bed at 10, you wake up at midnight, your bladder feels very full. You go to the bathroom, you pee, it up, you pee out a quarter cup. You go back to bed, you wake up an hour later, your bladder feels really, really full. You go to the bathroom, you pee out a tablespoon. You go back to bed, your bladder feels really, really full. 15 minutes later, you're back in the toilet and nothing comes out. Or if you push, you get a drop. Well, at that point in time, your bladder really is sincerely empty. It's empty, absolutely empty, but you feel full. Um, that's a classic sign uh, that I call that. That's kind of like your bladder screaming, help me, help me, help me. And generally that happens, uh, after like a really bad insult to your bladder. Uh, uh I used to have a lot of those flares and I'm pelvic floor driven, but I had a lot of those flares and, um, a lot of it was diet induced. I have a, a blog on our website I wrote years ago called Anatomy of an Utterly Ridiculous Sightsee Flare, where I was up all night like that, like that. So I had like hot sauce and then I had a fruit smoothie and then I had this and then I had that. And I'd had acids all day, which massively provoked my bladder and caused this terrible sensation where I felt very, very full, even though I was empty. So that's one thing that is possible. But the question is, is why would somebody with tight pelvic floor muscles have bladder wall sensitivity? 
Well, there is a toll to be taken when you have tight muscles over the long term because these tight muscles lift off the bone and they start squeezing blood vessels. If your bladder is supposed to get 24 units or 28 units of blood a day and it's only getting 10 because your muscles are tight, are you going to have a healthy bladder wall? No. That's called ischemia. I-S-C-H-E-M-I-A. And a lot of IC patients are ischemic patients. The problem is, is you do bladder therapies and you never get better. Why? Because bladder therapies will not fix the underlying problem because the underlying problem is tight pelvic floor muscles restricting blood supply. Our therapeutic priority for the muscle patient is to restore blood supply that when we get those muscles to relax and release and the blood is now flowing correctly and fully to the bladder, that bladder wall heals. So that's called the somatovisceral reflex. Can muscles change the way organs behave? Yes. But those muscles are, su I mean, if that bladder, no, if that muscle is super, super tight and restricting blood flow to the bladder, you're not going to have a healthy bladder wall. Chicken versus the egg. I have no idea what you are. You got bladder symptoms, but you got a, you got even worse muscle symptoms. If I were to make an educated guess, I think you're probably pelvic floor driven with a little bit of estrogen atrophy just starting on your bladder. But we got to get those muscles checked and those muscles healed. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Okay, let me get a drink. Jennifer says, can I write down the name of this product? Now, I haven't tried it yet, so I'm not recommending recommending it yet, but I promise you I will try it probably tonight because my muscles are not happy with me. Okay, hold on a sec here. Marlia said, there's a study on the COVID vaccine called COVID clots that was on full measure TV. The vaccine itself can cause clots just by getting vaccinated. I'm still, yeah, but that's, wasn't that the Novavax that's not being used? We're all different. It's just so difficult. Life is so complex right now with COVID. Because I believe you, honey. I'm not not believing you. I believe that you had problems with the vaccine you had. What vaccine did you get when that happened? She says that when she had the vaccine two years ago, she got stiff sore muscles that have gotten progressively worse and set my immune system on fire. Gave her fibromyalgia. Yeah. I would understand. I didn't get the flu vaccine. They wanted to do both. And I'm like, oh, hell no. Last time I got a flu vaccine, I ended up in the emergency room. Um, scared the living daylights out of me. So, and I'm not around a lot of children where I'm going to be exposed to flu. So I haven't had a flu vaccine in, since before COVID. The year, the fall before COVID started was when I had this freaky reaction to a flu vaccine. So... You had the Moderna. Yeah, and I had the Pfizer. I, I Yeah. Carolyn said, had my son at 17, long labor. I tore chronic UTIs then for 15 years, then into IC. Pelvic floor physical therapy didn't do much. Been on amitriptyline, now working on estradiol cream. When will my cream start working? Um. Well, so Carolyn, when you went to physical therapy, yeah, I know you said it didn't do much. But this is what I want to know. When you went to physical therapy, what did they find? Were your muscles tight or weak? Carolyn said, my vagina is on fire inside. Okay. They said you had a weak vaginal wall. Okay. 
Did they find any muscle tension at all? And maybe some issues with your uterus removal, okay? So, like bladder tilting, uh, that is not an insubstantial issue. That if your bladder is out of position, you know, if your bladder is tilting forward, it can actually kind of be folding over a little bit, which can be quite painful and uncomfortable. Hmm. Did they find any tension at all in your muscles? And are, do you struggle with incontinence? Okay. okay. You're not incontinent. Interesting. Do you have a prolapse? If you do jumping jack, yeah. If you do jumping jacks, or I bet if you cough a lot or sneeze, that's where I'm at right now. I never leaked with coughing until I got COVID last spring. The coughing was so violent, I actually leaked. And now I feel, you know, again, I'm 63. My muscles are weaker. I know this. My pelvic floor is weird. Um... Now, sometimes when I walk, I actually like feel like urine and almost in my urethra. I'm not leaking, but it doesn't quite feel right. This is all post COVID. Um, So that internal burning, did they take, okay, yeah, well, that was correct. She said they told me to do Kegel. Absolutely. If you're, if you're leaking and your muscles are weak, yeah, you do Kegels. Did the Kegels hurt? Were they painful at all? Kegels are okay. My burning just started in March. Does the burning change with body position? Does it get worse when you sit down? Does it get better when you stand up or bend over? Your doc says atrophy. Okay. So, you know, nerves can call burn, cause burning. <coughs> atrophy can cause burning. Um, I would have expected the estrogen to have made a substantial difference after a couple of weeks. You feel like there's a lighter on inside. See, and that's that's kind of speaks to me more of it sounds like a nerve is involved too. Do you ever have PGAD, like we could, persistent genital arousal do you, disorder, do you ever feel like slightly aroused, but it's really painful and icky and you don't want to tell anybody about it? Hi, Deborah. Hi, hun. How are you? Okay, so no PGAD. Do you ever have sciatica pain that shoots down your leg? Does the pain, does the burning change throughout the day? Okay, no leg pain. So do you, do you feel the burning at night when you're sleeping? When you're laying down and sleeping? Or does the burning change throughout the day?
it's a hot feeling during the day. What makes it better and what makes it worse? You do sleep at night. So have, have you found anything that makes it worse? Like sitting in a car. How about urinating? Do you feel like you're like, do you struggle with what we call urine burn, where your urine feels like it's very, very hot? It's just coming out of your body. Like it's burning your skin as it's coming out. Do you struggle with urine burn? Good to hear, Deborah. Good to hear. I'm glad you're doing well. I'm doing well. I had a I had a weird day yesterday, but I'm okay today. No, not like you're in burn. Well, I think you need a second opinion from a from a gynecologist because that's not your bladder. I mean, it, you could be bacterial vaginosis. I mean, they should probably take a swab and do some next generation DNA urine testing to, I mean, uh, not vaginal testing, secretion testing. Uh, the doc says you're red and dry. Okay. Uh, you have to understand when you're dry that anything that touches your skin down there, it's going to make it bad. And so something as simple as wearing a mini pad or using fabric softener or a dryer sheet could cause a lot of that because if you're dry, that means your skin doesn't have any defenses. You had a yeast infection, but it's gone now. Okay. Okay. Well, it sounds, it sounds like fundamentally it's a skin issue and the doctor says you're red and dry. So now we just have to figure out why your skin is compromised. Well, concept number one is the loss of estrogen. So you're doing exactly the right thing with your estrogen. Keep it up. I mean, um, you can watch, they have watched under an electron microscope, these skins, these skin cells get thicker and stronger and heavier, you know, normal when, when you give them estrogen. So be consistent with that estrogen. That's important. It's also the research shows to be quite safe when you're using it vaginally. Um, gosh, what else? Uh, is your vulva red and irritated too, or is it just on the inside? The outside feels okay. I would just be really, really tempted to ask for that next generation test. Because fungus matters, you had a candida infection. Can, and a lot of the candida infections now are very, very, very drug resistant. And there's always a chance that that fungus is back, that that yeast is back. And a next generation test, you guys, if you go to bladderhealth.org, bladderhealth.org, that's a website I built that talks about next generation testing and you can order it there. Um, I work with that company. I mean, I'm, I, I, I like data. I like facts. And having the best chest in the world tell you if we've got any bacterial or fungal issues going on it answers that key question. And I would expect that it would be helpful. She's asking how long it would work a couple of weeks to a month. Your final test was negative for we, for use three weeks ago. Okay. So now we're just dealing with very, really, really, really inflamed skin and dry skin. Sometimes doctors will prescribe a compounded cream that you can use. One of them is called an Amibac cream, which is amitriptyline and baclofen. The amitriptyline to calm the nerves down, the baclofen to relax muscles. Yeah, I would, I can't, of course sex would hurt. It sounds like it would be very painful. So there are some kind of custom compounded formulas that they might be able to give you that will try to improve the health of your skin and calm some of these nerves down. Um, my doctor gave me a compounded 
estrogen lidocaine jelly when I was dealing with a lot of pain on the outside. Um, so, um, so you could, I mean, another one, they could do a ketamine uh, cream down there, which might have some of these other ingredients in there. I've got some of that on the IC Network website. I would make sure that you're doing a good anti-inflammatory also. You've been on amitriptyline for 17 years. Okay. What? But what about Advil or Tylenol? Just to try to keep things calm and copacetic, so to speak. Bobby says, if sex doesn't hurt, this, this means it's not pelvic floor driven. Probably. Probably. Deborah says, yes, I have my good and bad days. You know, it's so interesting. I remember yesterday. I mean, I just woke up anxious yesterday. It's so weird. And, and that's, a, that's a menopause symptom where you wake up with free-floating anxiety and you ask yourself, why am I anxious? I have no freaking idea why I'm anxious. I was just anxious. And I was laying in my recliner, which is where I sleep. And um, because of my TMJ, it's a whole other story. Um, and I kind of let the anxiety, even it's during my stop sign, deep breath, you know, but I wanted to go walk and then I, I started a new blood pressure medication and I took that and I'm like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And anyway, it took me a couple hours to get myself moving, but I did go to the farmer's market and then I did a kick-ass double walk just to prove that I could do it. So I don't like trying new meds. You know, when you're super sensitive, like so many of us are, we have drug sensitivity. Trying anything new is just nerve wracking, literally. My blood pressure has been staying at like the high 130s over mid 80s to higher 80s. And like, I'm doing everything. I've lost 10 pounds. I'm not eating salt. And yet my blood pressure is staying at that level. But then, you know, the doctor's like, yeah, Jill, this is inherited. 50% of the women who go through menopause develop high blood pressure. Why? Because we, we, our ability to handle salt changes, we become more salt sensitive. And salt, unfortunately, causes us to hold fluid, which then it gives, increases our blood pressure. And so I'm not eating salt. I've lots of weight. I'm exercising almost every day. And it's just like really making me crazy. Uh, I mean, for me, I was handling everything so well. Because remember, I was caring for my parents and going through fire season. And my stress level was off the charts. But there was something about that high blood pressure diagnosis that just made me crazy. Because I felt like I was a failure. I mean, I just felt like I was a total failure. And, and you know what? You know, I mean, this is typical. So I took my blood pressure every day for six weeks. And without taking any meds, I got it down into the low 130s, over 80s. But then I developed this phobia about taking my blood pressure because I wasn't getting it down into the 120s. And um, anyway, you know. I let myself worry about, I, and you know me, what do I always say? If you're scared, go talk to your doctor. But it was COVID and I couldn't freaking get into my doctor. I finally forced it and got an appointment last week. And I saw a doctor face to face for the first time in five years. And I had to force it to get the appointment. It's like, I want to talk to you face to face about my blood pressure. I want you to see my body. Because I am in excellent shape. I mean, I could lose a couple more pounds, but that's a menopause belly. But anyway, I'm in excellent shape. And she met me and she goes, yeah, you're in great shape, Jill. This is hereditary for you. And then she said, that she said, first of all, you don't have high blood pressure. You have borderline high blood pressure. There's nothing about your case that scares me at all. This is your age and this is some genetics. 
So we're just going to try some meds. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't work, we'll try something else. Stop freaking worrying about it. And I'm like, okay, I can breathe. Like I was getting really upset about it. So now I'm just like, and part of it, well, and part of it was that I kept having to take my dad's blood pressure. And I have a lot of PTSD associated with that when he died. So just the sound of a blood pressure cuff makes me a little crazy. And I still have his blood pressure cuff and I want to throw it away. It, I just, too many bad memories associated with taking blood pressure. That's, that's the life of a caregiver. You know, for those of us who are caregiver, who were caregivers, and I cared for my parents for 15 years, there is an absolute toll that happens to caregivers. It is hard, hard work. And there is PTSD as we run, where they, you know, how many times you see, you see your elderly person sitting in, a, sitting in their recliner and, and you look to see if they're breathing or not. Have they died? You know, you're on the, have they you're on the have they died journey and i was on that journey for oh, a long time i feel better now though honestly honestly like i'm finding me again now like i'm starting to draw again um i love crafts i love working with my hands so the perfect vacation for me is not to hawaii i have no interest in that send me to a craft camp let me do something with my hands me draw, paint, do tile work. I don't care. Just let me play. Fabric. So I I have I I have quilting. I just am not into sewing right now. But I just started doing some drawing again. I want to take some classes in drawing. All right. Well, we've been here for two and a half hours. And as you know, I am here at your pleasure. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions you have. Uh, and if we're done, we can be done and y'all can go on and go enjoy making your Sunday dinner with your family. Or if anybody wants to go into Zoom, I can set up Zoom and we can talk face to face. Your choice. And as you can see, I love Halloween. Here are some of my decorations. And I found a fantastic Halloween music channel on YouTube. Oh, you guys, let me give you the link. It's so good. Um, Karen says, that pelvic floor pain, could this be caused by IC? Honey, it's the chicken versus the egg dilemma. Which comes first? Your bladder and your pelvic floor are intricately connected. They're both involved. But one is driving the other. So for some people, this begins with a bladder injury. And then the muscles get tight because your bladder's screaming in pain. That's a minority. For the great majority of patients, this all begins with a muscle problem, a pelvic injury, falling on your tailbone, having a baby, anything at all like that, where those muscles slowly over time get tighter and tighter and tighter. And they start cutting blood flow to the bladder, and then the bladder starts to develop symptoms. So, you know, you have to focus on both. We have got to get muscles relaxed. We have got to restore blood supply. So if you're having pelvic floor pain, that has to be a treatment priority for you, Karen. You cannot leave tight pelvic floor muscles untended because they'll just get tighter and tighter and they'll start really restricting blood supply. They'll start squeezing nerves and you're going to have pudendal neuralgia, PGAD, and sciatica. We got to get these muscles healthy. If you look at our guidelines, our guidelines are crystal clear. This is a neuromuscular order. We don't disorder. We don't think of this so much as a bladder disease anymore. Jennifer says, I can imagine that, ha that having PTSD has caused you some problems. Yeah, it has. But I'm tough. We're tough. We're collectively tough. We got through it. Erica says, I'm having a flare going on three weeks. It stemmed from extreme stress last month. My bladder and my inner thighs are in constant pain. Do you have frequency? My flares are usually calmed down after a few days. This is three weeks. I had a cystoscopy in 2021 where IC was confirmed. You've had IC for 20 years. So Erica, the single most important thing that you said is you have pain in your inner thighs. That is not your bladder. That is your pelvic floor. So what happens under periods of high stress is you go into fight or flight. 
What that means then is that fight or flight response raises your heart rate, raises your blood pressure. And what does it do? It tightens your muscles. So you are probably in extreme pelvic floor tension right now. Those muscles in your inner thighs go right up into your pelvic cavity. Also low back pain, that's uh, this is psoas muscles. Psoas, if people with tight pelvic floor muscles will often have low back pain. Thank you, Gay. Uh, Marlia says, does estradiol cause yeast infection after I use it? I tend to itch, but no cottage cheese discharge. No, you, you just have to understand that sometimes the base that they put estradiol in is, um, can be irritating. It can have preservatives in it. And so you want to ask for a preservative free estrogen cream. If you're struggling with that little bit of itch and burn after you, if it occurs, directly after you put the estradiol in, odds are it's probably something in the in the cream base. So they can switch that cream base up. Karen says, can you recommend exercises for the pelvic floor to help with pain? I can't get to see the consultant. Karen, if you come on over to the IC Network website and let me, you know what, at least here, so you guys, I'm live streaming right now. When I'm looking here, I'm looking at Facebook. When I'm looking over here, I'm looking at YouTube. Different computers, different internets. Okay, it's just that's the only way I can do this. So what I'm going to do here on Facebook is I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to show you where to find it. Okay, so give me a second here. All right, all right. So I'm going to share my screen and look, it's clean. <laughs> You can actually see, I always have nature scenes on my computer. I have this beautiful owl on both. I, actually, I sit in front of three computers and I use them all. They all do different things. And believe me, I need them all. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to come over to the IC Network website. So icnetwork.org. And just so you know, um, I just put uh, pumpkin drop cookies, the perfect bladder friendly Halloween treat. Uh, so we have a lot of blogs. We do several articles uh, a month of new content that you can read. Okay. So come on over to the IC network and check out our blogs. We work hard on those. So what you're going to do is you're going to go to our IC information center and click the very bottom link, which is free downloads. And the very first one you can click is our pelvic floor relaxation series. It's a PDF file, and you can just print this sucker out. Now, you, for, you, for you guys on, on YouTube, I'm sorry, I can't share my screen on YouTube. I don't have it set up to do that um, because this is that's an old computer. It's like seven years old. And it's hanging on by a thread. And, and the software won't work on this. It won't let me update it. So um, for on YouTube, come on over to the IC Network website. Go to the very first link in the pull-down menu. It's IC Information Center. Click on the link. Go all the way down to the bottom link. It says free downloads. And we have a lot of free downloads. Print out. All right, so there are your exercises. And if you're an IC Network member, it's on your member page. You guys, if you find these meetings helpful, uh, please think about becoming a member of the IC Network because you'll have your own member page with lots of downloads. And if you, d depending upon the membership you get, you get books. You get like our IC 101. It's not just a bladder disease book, which is pretty cool. Uh, along with our book, the IC Chef Cookbook, and lots and lots of downloads. And I'm working on more right now. But now that I have the time, I'm actually able to do stuff again. I got so many things I want to do for you. Uh, Marlia says, I got compounded estradiol cream and it was worse. So I went back to the estradiol. Go figure. Yeah, it's about the base. I get mine from the Women's International Pharmacy, and I've done very, very good with it. 
I mean, if you're itching really badly the next day, that just means to me that there's something in it that might be quite irritating. So it's not the estradiol or the estriol, it's the base. So they can put it in an oil like olive oil or coconut oil. That would be interesting to see if that worked for you. Premarin is the most notorious for causing irritation. Most notorious. Because it has an alcohol, I think it has an alcohol in it to uh, act as a preservative. And the alcohol in that dry skin is quite painful. So I found my missing folder of bladder images. I still haven't found my bladder images from my high gear distension. It is somewhere in my files here. But um, I think you might find this interesting. I think we've already, already gone over this a bit, but Hunter's lesions. So again, five to 10% of IC patients have Hunter's lesions. And the most typical Hunter's lesion is like this. It has a, what we call a stellate appearance where arms radiate from it. And there's often a, a little a, a kind of blood clot, blood vessel right there. See that, see that see that a, a very, very strong centered area. Sometimes though, um, here, hold on, there's another. I've got two pages of images. A doctor published an atlas of Hunter's lesions. Jennifer, um, you know, honey, if there's, she says, I wish that I could afford. If there's anything you need, just email me. Okay, listen. And, and by the way, got you guys, I still have quite a few old magazines. I think I have 25 old magazines. Uh, I send two each to people who just want copies of old magazines. And so if you email me your mail, your, your mailing address, some of you emailing me your email address, that's not going to help me send you a magazine. If you want me to snail mail you some back issues of our magazine, I'm happy to do it because I always have back issues. They're older. They might be a couple years old, but there might be something in there that help that will help. So Jennifer, my email address is icnetwork at mac.com, icnetwork at mac, that's short for Macintosh computer, so mac.com. You know, like, here's the thing about the IC network, you got to understand, I don't turn anybody down. When you call, I don't ask if you're a Republican, I don't ask if you're a Democrat, I don't ask if you're a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim. I don't ask any of that. Most important thing to me is, do you have pain? And if you have pain, I want to help. It's that easy. And if you're low income and there's a barrier, you let me know about it because I might be able to help you with that. Uh, our manufacturers are, uh, will often help if I've got a patient in crisis who can't afford something. And there's no shame. We've all been there. I lived on credit cards for five years the year I, I started the IC network. I couldn't work. I was like $50,000 in debt at the end of five years. Um, Karen asked, do you ship in the United, to the United Kingdom? Right now, we cannot. But if you have a friend or family member here in the United States, we can ship it to them, and then they can send it to you as a gift. But when you guys had Brexit, it changed all the rules. And we, are, we can't afford it. We are required to, to collect VAT at the type of purchase. We are required to hire a VAT consultant, which is expensive, which I can't afford to do. So if I try to ship it to the United Kingdom, I have to put on the customs form what it is, how much it's worth, and my business. In contrast, if I ship it to somebody in the U.S. and they send it to you, they can send it to you as a gift. And that bypasses that. But right now, unfortunately, Karen, I wish I could help. I can't. Uh, Brexit really changed everything. Okay, let's get back to this picture. So um, row A are inflamed hunter's lesions. Very, very inflamed hunter's lesions. Row B, these are non-inflamed hunter's lesions. They're white. So we're... 
so you can see right here, see it's white in the area. This might have been uh, treated with laser therapy at one point in time or fulguration. So that's, uh, you know, I mean, that's not normal either. Okay. And if we look at these pictures, A, this is the, these are Hunter's lesions with a coagulum, that center point. And these are, row B is classic Hunter's lesions without the coagulum. And of course, the question is, what causes Hunter's lesions? Well, now we have very strong evidence supporting that it's a virus, viral infection, Epstein-Barr, polyoma. Uh, but it can also happen if nerves are very, very inflamed. So that's why we want these lesions treated. If we seal, seal the lesion, they're not going to be so painful. All right, last call for questions. Last call for, what are you going to make for dinner? Hmm. I've been cooking, oh, you know what? I have, um, I have a hummus and I have food from my, my favorite natural restaurant. The East West Cafe. So I've got hummus, I've got pita, I've got beet delight. But I think I might make, um, I've got a butternut squash and I've got a spaghetti squash. You know, I, and it's really cold and rainy here, as you can see. I think I'm going to bake some butternut squash and make a soup out of it. Erica says, thank you. I'm just going to try the pelvic exercises you just showed us. My belly is so swollen from this flare. I believe in 2021 I had an ulcer. I don't exactly remember what kind. Okay. Just go channel, hun. Go channel. You're in a you're in a wicked flare, so everything's sensitive down there. But again, the fact that you have pain on your inner thighs, slam dunk pelvic floor flare. But I'm not your doctor and I can't give you medical advice. My job is to educate you, inform you, and then kick you in the church and get you back to the doctor with a new question like, hey, why do my why do my inner thighs hurt? Could this be from my tight pelvic floor muscles? Maybe I should go to a physical therapist. What do you think about that idea? <laughs> Sometimes you have to lead them along the way, if you know what I mean. All right, any other questions? Okay, I think we're done. So um, I uh, so what am I doing? So we're finishing up our fall IC Optimist this week, um, and uh, they'll be at the typesetter and the printer uh, next week. Um, what else am I doing? Um, working on our master class in IC. I'm working on a lot more videos. So you guys, if you like these meetings, make sure you follow our page here on Facebook, follow our page, subscribe over on YouTube. Uh, make sure that you click the notification button so you get notified when I put up new videos or go live. And of course, last but not least, come on over to the IC Network website and at least sign up for our free newsletter. Listen, I do not abuse the free newsletter. I only send out clinical trial announcements, and our newsletter. I don't sell it. Your privacy is absolutely maintained. Um, um, and it's my way of communicating with IC patients the latest news. Uh, but we also have members, memberships, where you get our magazine, the IC Optimist. Um, let's see, I've been giving them all away. Here, hold on, I've got some right here. So, whoops, if anybody wants uh, 
some back issues. I can show you these are these issues are a few years old. This was a really good issue because the course on AUA was fantastic. AUA was fantastic this year. First time they talked about medical marijuana. Uh, just to show you some things, here is another one. Meet the IC expert, Dr. Ken Peters. This is our first discussion of phenotypes, and that was back in 2015. 2019, the great debate is I see the result of infection. The answer is not usually. Summer survival strategies. What do you need to know about CBD? What else do I have? Uh, this issue is dedicated more to pain, the chilling effect of the CDC guidelines on chronic pain. And if you're a member of the IC network, you already can download these and read them right off your member page. Right? My goal with these, these are not brag pieces. I don't talk about, I, I don't talk about awards or anything like that. I want you within five minutes to find something helpful when you read one of our magazines or you come to our website. Florence, you absolutely can. You can also call me at 1-800-928-7496. Uh, I mean, we're a business. We're a health education business. Uh, and my day, my days are usually filled with patient phone calls. Um, and I'm always happy to talk with somebody over the phone. If you just have a couple questions, good to go. Absolutely no charge. Uh, sometimes that can lead to a two hour discussion. No charge is fine. Um, but if you want to get ahead in the queue, I operate first come first serve. Um, and so, and I'm in California, so I work late. So sometimes for people on the East Coast, you might call it eight in the morning. I might not call you back until eight o'clock at night because there's usually a fairly big queue I've got to get through of people. Um, uh, so anyway, you're absolutely welcome to email me, icnetwork at mac.com. You're welcome to call. Um, oh, this is so weird. Um, I didn't get that. Oh, Siri just copied everything I wrote because I put the magazine down on my keyboard. Um, you just can't text. And please don't message me through Facebook because I don't get to it very much. Sometimes I find old, old messages. And thank you for the thing on the shirt. I love this shirt. Uh, I have a pink one and a black one too. <laughs> but it's I got it at Sports Authority like seven years ago. Hi, Bonnie. Florence says, thank you. It's comforting to know that I can talk to someone knowledgeable. I'm in Boston. There used to be an excellent IC support group in Boston run by a woman named Molly Glidden. Uh, when there was an IC conference um, that I was supposed to host, I was supposed to uh, moderate um, two weeks after 9-11. Um, and um, I wouldn't get on a plane to go to Boston. I was too scared. So, um, and my grandmother died two weeks after 9-11, but still. Uh, there, so there has been some really good IC work in Boston. Thank you, Gay. Thank you. I appreciate your compliments. So I think I already got an email from somebody who wants magazines. Mama Hen. Oh, hold on. Karen says here, are probiotics for the urinary tract helpful? Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially because we have new research from Dr. Uh, Ackerman at UCLA. You know, so, and I went, I went through this a couple of weeks ago in one of the meetings. So, you know, they were hoping that they would find the smoking gun in IC patients, basically a bacteria that caused everything. Like Helicobac Helicobacter pylori is the cause of ulcers, stomach ulcers. Well, for the last 20 years, they've been looking for the smoking gun bacteria that they thought would cause IC. And they never found it. And now that we have next generation DNA urine testing, it's not there. What the next generation DNA urine testing continues to find 
is that I see patients have a normal biome, but it's less diverse. So we're missing some important bacteria, but it's not bad, but it's just less diverse. So it's not as healthy. And that makes sense because if there's any group of patients who I think are have been massively overexposed to antibiotics, which of course destroys the biome, it's going to be the lower urinary tract patient. I'm sure we've all taken massive amounts of antibiotics over the years for these quote unquote bladder infections that were never bladder infection. But then the other thing that our biome studies have found is that we are over dominant in lactobacillus. Now lactobacillus is good bacteria, right? Well, Dr. Ackerman is a is probably one of the world's leading specialists in, in the biome. And she got interested in IC a couple of years ago. And so she had decided to replicate the biome studies to see if she could find the smoking gun. And she spoke about this for the first time during the IC course at the American Neurology Association meeting last May. And, at, and her research is fascinating. So at first glance, I think she had 80 or 90 patients in her study looking at the urine. She found exactly the same thing, less diverse, overabundant in lactobacillus. But then she started looking at the urine results based upon phenotype. Because remember, we have all these different groups. So we got the pelvic floor patient versus the widespread pain patient versus the hunter's lesion versus the estrogen atrophy. And that's where she first found differences. That the patients who had bladder-centric pain, pain on bladder fill, were overabundant in a very specific lactobacillus called lactobacillus einer. And lactobacillus einer is not a good bac uh, bacteria. It's a bad bacteria. Lacto the lactobacillus normally protects us. It helps uh, kill yeast. It kills fungus. It um, is a balancing, it's a, it has a balancing effect. But lactobacillus einers does not kill fungus. And it resembles other pathogenic bacteria like Proteus in the sense that it damages skin. It's damaging. So what she found is that bladder-centric patients who suffer with pain on bladder fill often had an overabundance of lactobacillus einer. Patients who were pelvic floor-centric, normal, completely normal, no lactobacillus einer. And then patients who did not have bladder-centric pain, but had like vaginal pain, they were overabundant in E. coli. Now, these are this preliminary data. This was the lead story in my magazine last summer. And so you guys, for those of you who are members, go back to your magazine and read it. Because this opens up something nobody has ever talked about before. And that is long-term damage that antibiotics cause to the biome. So lactobacillus einer. So the question is, what the hell is lactobacillus einer? Well, number one, you can't culture it unless you give them blood. So they didn't even identify lactobacillus einer until like five years ago when they started doing cultures that had blood in it. And then they go, oh, what's this? This is something new. And then in, in more and more studies, including bacterial vaginosis, 
lactobacillus inerts is playing a huge role at, in bacterial vaginosis. Um, and so the question again is, why? So I did a deep dive into the research, and more research is coming, but here's the thing about inerts, is that it's the first lactobacillus to grow after antibiotics use. It is just a very hardy bacteria. And so it grows first and it dominates. And a biome that's dominant in lactobacillus inerts is associated with poor outcomes in bacterial vaginosis. In contrast, a biome that is dominant in lactobacillus crispatus, which is a good, healthy lactobacillus, is associated with a very good outcome. So the question is, is our pro probiotics for the urinary tract helpful? Absolutely. Because we have got to repopulate the, the tissue, uh, the urinary tract with good, healthy bacteria after antibiotic use. Now, this is all new, but in my opinion, it's huge. And I'm going to be on top of this. I hope to interview Dr. Ackerman uh, maybe next year. It is just fantastic research. And it's going to really challenge those who say everybody should be on antibiotics because lactobacillus inerts may in fact be that smoking gun and it's triggered potentially by antibiotic use. So we'll see. It's all theoretical. It has to be. You need more research to prove it, but it's huge. Uh, so that's just in the last couple of months. Um, and if that's the case, and we're going to have to change our phenotyping again, and in that diagnostic workup at that very first appointment, as we were talking about when I started this meeting, when they do those basic urine tests, they're going to need to check for INERS. Um, because the last thing we want to do is mess up the biome even more. Anyway, there's lots, lots more coming. I'm talking with another couple of companies. We're working on a few things. I can't tell you what they are now. But interesting news. So if we go back for me, I broke my tailbone when I was 14. Massive pelvic floor tension. But they, they didn't know that back then. We know that now. Didn't know that back then. What did they do? I remember them feeding me 16 pills of sulfa at my first appointment. You know, put it on my tongue, swallow, put it on my tongue, swallow, put a 16 pills. And you know, the guy who won the Nobel Prize for inventing antibiotics predicted this. You look at his Nobel Prize acceptance. He said the indiscriminate use of antibiotics is going to create uh, wide, wide scale problems, uh, especially the production of drug resistant infections. But now that we have the lactobacillus research, we've got a secondary thing, and that is it disrupts the good bacteria. Okay. Um, Janet says, I want to thank you so much again. A few years back watching you, I started looking at my pelvis differently. Long story short, I've been diagnosed with HEDS, hypermobile Ehlers Danlos, in which my IC is part. My IC pain was reduced greatly by just an SI belt and a pillow between my legs. You changed my life literally and profoundly. I can't thank you enough, Jill. You're an angel. I'm, oh, honey, I'm so happy for you. You know, and I have an SI belt and I sleep when I sleep on my side. I sleep with a pillow between my legs. Um, I'm so happy for you. I'm so, oh, you just. Janet, you just totally made my day. Thank you so much for sharing your story. That's so exciting. It sucks that you've got Ehlers-Danlos, but at least we know. You know, the mystery is gone. And now you've got real practical things that you can do to help. So this is fantastic. 
Mama Hen says, can you flare, can you have a flare that feels like constant pressure to urinate like a UTI? I've always mainly had pelvic pain. This is a constantly feeling like I have to go even immediately after trying. So mama, um, I talked about this a little while ago. There are two different scenarios that I think can cause that. Concept number one, very, 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 very tight muscles. And concept number two is a severely inflamed bladder wall. So um, it's that feeling like you're full even when you're empty, feeling like you need to pee constantly, even though you know your bladder is empty. And so in a typical flare, you go to bed at 10, you wake up at midnight, you pee out a quarter cup of urine. You go back to bed, you wake up an hour later, you pee out a tablespoon. You go back to bed, 15 minutes later, you're, you can't even sleep, your bladder feels very, very full. You go to the bathroom, nothing, or you might, if you strain, you might get a drop. And for the rest of that night, you're stuck exactly where you are. You're stuck with this, oh my God, my bladder feels full, even though it's empty. And it's the worst, it's the worst, most frustrating feeling. And now generally, that type of flare is caused by something which is massively irritating your bladder. That one cup of coffee a day would do that. That would create the foundation for all this. Or green tea. That there's, to me, whenever I work with a patient who's struggling with that, I really probe for daily irritants. Because the, the times that that's happened to me is almost always been driven by diet choices. That there's just something tweaking the hell out of my bladder every day. If you're taking a multivitamin every day, if you're drinking too much alkaline water or too much acid water, if you're having a soda, you're using artificial sugar, if you just cannot give up that one cup of coffee a day, that could easily be the cause of that. And so um, a couple of things you could do is number one, dilute your urine, make sure you drink some water. Let's get, I mean, look at the color of your urine. Is it dark yellow or brown? If it is, you're dehydrated. And that urine has become super, super concentrated and is now really, really irritating. Your urine should be a pale, clear yellow. If it's dark yellow or brown, you need to drink water and dilute your urine. If your urine is clear, you're drinking too much water. Again, we're looking for pale, clear yellow, right? So look at your urine. Let's see where you are. The second thing you could try is alkalinizing your urine. It's just a typical bladder wall, bladder flare protocol that we have in our book, IC101, or on our website. So when you, you have a bladder wall flare, number one, delete your urine. Number two, if you've eaten something you shouldn't have eaten, you can try alkalinizing your urine by sucking on a Tums or taking a cup of pre-leaf or a tiny bit of baking soda in a glass of water. That will alkalinize any residual urine. The problem with baking soda is that it's sodium bicarbonate. And if you're prone to high blood pressure, it's going to raise your blood pressure. So we don't recommend that. Tums is the easy no-brainer or pre-leaf. You, you can see pre leaf up on, up on the wall back there, right? Um, the next thing you could do, wait, do that, wait an hour or two. If you're still really struggling, you could try azo because that numbs the nerves on your bladder wall. That's the stuff that turns your urine orange, pyridium. Um, if that's ineffective, you can ask for a rescue installation. Go to the doctor, ask them to do a heparin lidocaine installation. The heparin coats your bladder, the lidocaine turns the nerves off. And that might feel good, but it sounds like you're in a very, very severe bladder flare. And again, it might, it could easily be something you're eating every day that you think is okay. That's actually not okay. I was working with a guy, again, I, I taught, told a story earlier. He was going through chemotherapy for bladder cancer and they, uh, they gave him too much med. He overdosed on the chemotherapy and he's got this massive burn in his bladder. I mean, it's really bad. And his pain level off the charts. 
and I can barely walk. The pain is so bad. And the doctor is like, well, we're sorry. We just gave you too much. Well, he was drinking a cup of coffee a day. And I said, honey, you can't do that. And he's like, why? And I said, if you had a burn on your hand, would you pour coffee on it? He goes, no. Well, why are you doing that to your bladder? That that acid every day literally destroys the next generation of cells that are trying to heal your bladder. You know, you got to remember your bladder is composed of the largest single cells in the human body. These are umbrella cells. They do not heal overnight. When one umbrella cell is damaged, it takes two weeks for that next generation, that little tiny stem cell, to grow in size and change shape and fill in where that umbrella cell was. And this is from a National Institutes of Health lecture I went to. That stem cell, while it's growing and trying to heal your bladder, is exquisitely vulnerable to acid. One cup of coffee will destroy the entire next generation of cells. And what the lecturer said is that the bladder simply cannot heal if you pour acid on it every day. That's why diet modification is so incredibly important. All right, so mama hand, getting back to mama here. I was diagnosed in 2005. I avoid the triggers. So much pressure in my urethra area that hurts. Okay, so mama, have you had a pelvic floor assessment? Because that's the other thing. Remember, back when you were diagnosed in 2005, everybody thought this was an incurable bladder disease. Well, that's not what they think now. Now we know that I see for the great majority of us is a neuromuscular disease. It's not actually not a disease at all. It's an injury. And so, you know, now we very clearly understand that tight pelvic floor muscles take a terrible toll on the bladder over time because those tight muscles start to restrict blood supply to the bladder. And it's, it's simply impossible for your bladder to be healthy if it's not getting the blood, the blood supply it normally needs. So, Mama, have you had a pelvic floor assessment? You need one. If you're having urethral pain, we need to look at we need to look at the muscles down by your urethra. We also need to look at the quality and health of your skin. Do we have estrogen atrophy? That urethra is kind of the canary in the coal mine when it comes to estrogen atrophy. So you have to kind of throw out what they told you so long ago. You instead are an anatomical mystery to be solved. There is un, and we have to really kind of do a deep dive into your tissues to try to understand what's driving us. You know, the fact that you've been in pain a long time and you probably have been on bladder treatments is important because if bladder treatments aren't working, is it your bladder? It might not be. It's probably, or it could relate to a great degree on your muscles and other things. So if you want to call me this week, uh, we can try to phenotype you. I mean, that's usually what I do over the phone is try to do a deeper dive into your history and symptoms to give you a new set of questions that you can ask your doctor. Because again, I'm not a doctor. I don't give you medical advice. I'm an educator. Um. Mama said she started HRT in July. Good. Well, it depends upon the type of HRT. Some of the brand names like Premarin might be a bit more irritating. We tend to do better with the preservative free formulas. But, you know, the big giant missing piece based upon when you were diagnosed is your muscles. We have to know what your muscles are. Because if your muscles have been tight for the last 25 years, we can fix that. Remember, I did bladder treatments for 30 years. They never helped me. But you know what got me pain-free was pelvic floor physical therapy because it was never my bladder. It was always my muscles and nerves. Vita says, do I need a cystoscopy to know for sure if I have IC? I want to get one, but I heard it's very painful. Vita, there are two different types of cystoscopies. There's a plain cystoscopy that can be done in the doctor's office. I call that a looky-loo. That's basically, they just numb your urethra, stick a cystoscope in, take a quick look around. They might put a little tiny bit of fluid in there to rinse it out, pull it out, you're done. If they have the right equipment, a flexible cystoscope, 
<coughs> they can actually also look for Hunter's lesions. So that's easy. Really, the only issue with an in-office cysto, number one, it cannot be a hydrodistension. They should not be filling your bladder full with fluid. That's painful. But if it's a simple looky-loo, that can be done in the doctor's office. I've had two. My doctor wanted me to do one right now. I would do it. I'm not afraid of it at all. The challenge with having a cystoscopy is peeing afterwards. Is your urethra has been stretched out and for a couple of days your urethra is not going to be happy with you and especially that first time you pee really difficult you got to bite your lip and just go for it but it, that always does get better um with a flexible cam yes it's a it's a flexible cystoscopy uh, another name or it can be something called narrowband imaging now Let's say, for example, you have a lot of blood in your urine. Let's say you're over 50. Let's say your, your symptoms are very, very painful. Let's say you've tried bladder treatments and they've never worked. At that point in time, they might want to do a hydrodistension with cystoscopy. And I'm not against that. I, I don't like guessing. I like facts. And if I'm in pain, I want somebody to look and tell me what's wrong. It's that simple. If I'm screaming in pain, for God's sake, look, I'm not interested in your guessing. I want you to look at, look at it and tell me what's wrong with it. And so a hydrodistension is the way of looking more closely at the bladder, um, but it does involve more trauma to the bladder because they fill your bladder with fluid, stretch it a little tiny bit, empty it out, fill it with fluid again. So the hydrodistension should always be done under sedation in an outpatient center or in the hospital. And the recovery is a little bit more challenging because uh, you've stretched the bladder and the bladder doesn't like that. And there can be pain. Somebody was in here earlier. We just had one two days ago. Um, they also want to do urodynamics another time. Do you recommend it? No. Urodynamics, if you read our guidelines, uh, not useful for the diagnosis of IC. I've had it done. Uh, all it's going to do is tell us if your nerves are not functioning. Um, I would, I would encourage you to come on over to the IC network website, icnetwork.org and read through the diagnostic workup. Um, you have Citrobacter coseri, but two rounds of Bactrim and Cipro didn't work. Also, what's your take on phage therapy and Euromune? Euromune is the, um, the new UTI vaccine, MV140 is another name for it. Uh, very, very exciting. The data looks really good. Um, I just I just put an article on it. Uh, we have an article that we just wrote on our website two weeks ago about the UTI vaccines. Uh, you can read that. Um, that the results of patients who are getting recurring UTI, like the results are stunningly high at preventing UTI. Um, and the adverse events appear to be mild when they happen. Uh, I'd like a little bit more information on the adverse events, to be quite honest. Um, but the early data with Euromune is very, very good. Um, uh, phage therapy means that you're using a section of virus to deliver a treatment into the body. Uh, bacteria phage therapy. Um, uh, it's new. Uh, we need a lot more information on that. Uh, I don't have any data that I'm aware of of it being used in IC patients, although it's possible. I just maybe I just haven't seen the study. Um, the um, Citrobacter coseri was that confirmed with a next generation DNA urine test? Um, that's unusual. Um, you don't really see that come up in some of these studies. Um, hold on. Found in UTIs, wound respiratory meningitis, and sepsis. Doesn't come up very often. Um, low virulent Citrobacter coseri can cause life threatening infections. Neonates and other immune compromised patients are particularly susceptible to infection from C. coseri.
any infection due to Secosteri mandates antimicrobial therapy based upon the sensitivity of the pathogen, in other words, next generation DNA urine tilts or a antibiotic sensitivity testing, various types of antibiotics, including amino glycosides, carbapenems, cephalosporins, fluoramphenicol, and quinolones are used for the treatment. Rational choice is, for citrobacter is a challenge for clinicians because there is a sustained increase in antibacterial resistance. Mm. That's old though. Let's see. Let's see if there's anything new. Wow. Boy, it sure, uh, a lot of research on it. Yeah, they found it on traction sutures for hip replacement surgery. Biodegradation of polyvinyl chloride by Citrobacter cruciri from what? A wow. All right, honey, listen. You just did the microgen. 93%. Damn. Did the microgen testing identify uh, a drug resistance genes? Did I did I identify drug res a drug resistant profile for you? Oh, honey, boy, you got your you're you're in a battle right now. Wow. I would think that you would be working with an infectious disease doctor. I mean, I think your case certainly is probably too complex for a local urologist. You you need to be working with a regional urologist, maybe somebody at a, a university who has more experience uh, working with more complex infections because that is a very complex UTI. Honey, where do you live? What's your, um, yeah, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm I'm so sorry that you're going through that. You know, kind of you know, when we think about infections, right? We 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 have to think about a healthy biome. The ultimately in the end, before mankind made antibiotics, the question is how did the human body what were the human body's defenses for infection? And because we have trillions of bacteria in our body, ultimately in the end, it's basically bacterial warfare that the good bacteria are keeping the bad bacteria in check. The good bacteria are keeping the fungus in check, right? That, that And I think in the future, mark my word, this is my estimate, I think 10 years from now, we're going to be treating infections with the good bacteria that will target and kill the bad bacteria. We may get to the point where antibiotics, you know, are just ineffective and we've got to try to repair and restore that biome so that the biome itself can get in and clean up the bad things, right? Oh, you have SIBO. All your issues started from there. Bad gut dysbiosis. You're in the, you're in LA and you and you're a caregiver. Are you part of Kaiser? What's your insurance? Is it Kaiser Permanente or do you have United Healthcare? Who's your who's your insurance?
I would think that a lot of this is going to be you restoring your biome and reducing some of that inflammation. So no sugar, I mean, following the SIBO diet, really trying to give your body what it needs to be, to get itself regulated again. You're aminoglycoside and tetracycline resistant. You know, I'm aminoglycoside resistant too. You have Anthem. Well, I think, um, you know what I would do if I were you, hon, is I would look up infectious disease specialists and see if you can find an infectious disease specialist who will work with you. Um, because that's not in, that is not a simple UTI. That is definitely going to be a more challenging UTI. And you eat so clean 90% of the time. Fruit is your one vice. You've been eating pretty clean since last summer. Well, just keep it up. Keep it up and understand too, as a caregiver, you know, um, are you caregiving at home or, or are you going, are you working in assisted living? Where are you caregiving? Um, and Bobby asked here on Facebook, what are my thoughts on hormone pellets? I don't really, uh, I don't really have any thoughts on them at all. I'm, I, I think that they're associated with a higher risk of cancer because they're relying on your bloodstream to send it throughout your body. I think that the topical estro estrogen is going to be much safer than a pellet. Your urologist wants to do a cystoscopy and a urodynamics. You went to Dr. Irwin. He's convinced it's GSM. Well, listen, GSM absolutely is going to be playing a role. Because um, how old are you, Vita? Okay, just like me. I was taking care of my elderly mom and dad. Um, honey, how old are you? Are you in your 50s? So, and she, you guys, she's on YouTube and she's on a five second delay. So she can't, we always have to force a delay on YouTube. Um, how old are you, hun? I know, but how old are you? So, okay. So, honey, at the age of 50, you are in estrogen atrophy. Your estrogen level started dropping in your 40s, maybe even earlier. If you had an early hysterectomy, it would have been when you had the hysterectomy, a total hysterectomy. So, you have to understand that your bladder is very estrogen dependent. Um, your bladder is like your mouth. It's a hollow organ with a really thick, wet coating. And that coating, that mucus, that glycosaminoglycan layer acts as a barrier. It protects the skin. Bacteria have to chew through it to get, basically, to get, not that they have teeth. They don't have teeth. But it's hard for bacteria to get through this mucus. And so that mucus is really important to our long-term health and really also it's a very important defense mechanism for infection. But it's also estrogen dependent. So when you're young, you got lots of estrogen, you got lots of mucus. At the age of 50, you don't have the estrogen, therefore you don't have the mucus. Therefore, your bladder is wide open for infection. And so is your vagina. What the research has shown for people who do get recurring UTI, that the bacteria usually first starts to live in the vagina, and then it takes about 24 hours to migrate to the bladder. And so that then led the researchers to ask, well, what's happened to vaginal defenses? And it goes right back to estrogen atrophy. So that genital urinary syndrome of menopause theory is solid. If your skin is dry, you know, that's absolutely a major contributor to you being vulnerable to infection. <clears throat> and so you doing estrogen to improve that health is important. The problem now is that you already have the active infection. And so you have to combine, you've got 
multiple things you've got to do. You got to work on the skin and get that mucus going. That topical estrogen does that. But we still have to try to kill the, the infection you have. You have terrible bladder and vaginal infections. So what are you doing about it? Are you using estrogen? You got you to gotta work on that skin, hun. So I think that doctor has a very, very important point. I would support that. Not that my opinion is important. It's not important because I'm not your doctor. Again, I'm an educator. So Vita, if you want to talk, feel free to give me a phone call. You can, our phone number is, I keep pushing it out of the way. Eight hundred nine two eight seven four nine six. 928 7496 Just know that Mondays are my day off. Mondays are the days when I actually try to get other stuff done. Uh, though I do start answering the phone usually after noon on Mondays, but often I don't. Uh, but Tuesday through Friday are my big phone dates. So you're welcome to call. And I answer the corporate line and I answer the patient education line. Uh, Vita said, you did two months of estriol, DHEA, and boric acid. I did estradiol and did nothing, progesterone topical. Okay, but honey, you got to keep doing it. It's not, it's not about treating the infection. It's a, about improving the quality and health of your skin. Two weeks of estrogen is going to do nothing. You, this is about being very consistent, wanting to keep that skin as healthy as possible, right? So, you know, you got to have a reality check with that estrogen. It's important, but it's not necessarily going to make that symptom go away right away. But you have to be very invested in wanting to keep your skin as healthy as possible. And that estrogen will really help with that. Okay. All right, guys. Any other questions? Any other questions? We've been here for how long have we been here now? Three and a half hours. I do have a dent I do have a dentist appointment this week. Getting my crowns, my impl my crown my implants crown finally. I'm so happy. All right guys, I think we'll call it here. I will see you next week. Knock on wood, knock on wood. Halloween, Halloween show. I'm going to be wearing my costume. Which is easy. It's just going to be wings because I love wings. It's all right. Okay, guys, I will see you later. Be well. I'm going to say goodbye to YouTube first. Bye, you guys. See you later.